Well, uh, I'm supposed to give uh, uh, welcome remarks. So first of all, I would say welcome, bienvenuti, dobrodošli, ahlan wa sahlan. And uh, then I will give really a few remarks. And uh, I will resist the temptation anyway to intervene on the substance of uh, today's conference, uh, Conflict and Cooperation in the Mediterranean, Mare Nostrum or Global Space. This is the question. And this happens in the framework of the Young Bled Strategic Forum. And uh, I will restrain myself only to say how glad I am to see that the, my initial proposal last year has borne fruit even beyond my original expectations. Indeed, uh, after uh, Instituto Affari Internazionali and Center for European Perspectives uh, agreed uh, to have in the Young BSF uh, 2018 edition the conference uh, on uh, the Mediterranean dimension of the OSCE, in the context of the then uh, Italian presidency. Their cooperation developed further and led to this event uh, with the support uh, of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Compagnia di San Paolo uh, International Affairs and uh, OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. I am therefore very grateful to the YAI Vice President, Mr. Greco, and to Young uh, uh, BSF Director and SEP uh, Representative, Ms. Uh, Mukherina. And I would like to thank them, as well as all the scholars uh, and experts uh, from academia and think tanks uh, that uh, will take the floor today. I also would like to express my appreciation to the representatives of the Slovenian authorities, Ambassador Logar from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, Honorable uh, Peric, head of the National Assembly's delegation to the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly for their contribution to today's proceedings. A special welcome and thank um, also goes to the protagonists of the Young Blood Strategic Forum, a group of committed and qualified people. I am convinced that foreign policy is not only the prerogative of governments and diplomats, uh, uh, but uh, needs uh, uh, must be enriched by the contribution of think tanks, NGOs, and civil society at large, of which the youth constitutes an essential and most promising element. In democratic regimes especially, the more policies are shared, understood, and supported, the, the better. And I have taken also initiatives in addition to young BSF during my mission in Slovenia, uh, uh, with and for the youth, for instance, with the conference organized uh, uh, with the University of Ljubljana for the 20th anniversary of the Rights of the Child Convention, uh, with the active involvement uh, of students uh, from all Slovenian universities. Finally, I would like to invite you all to remind you that there is a buffet lunch at the end of our debate offered by the Italian Embassy in Ljubljana as part of our financial effort in support of today's conference. So thank you very much for your kind attention and I wish you a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, moderator. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Excellencies, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, and especially uh, warm welcome to all young participants uh, to this event. It gives me indeed uh, a privilege and great honor to welcome you all uh, at the 14th uh, events uh, Blade Strategic Forum and its young dimension addressing the conflict and cooperation in the Mediterranean with the title Mare Nostrum Global Space. I'm speaking on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I bring you the best wishes from my minister and my colleagues in the, in the ministry. I am also delighted uh, that today's panel is organized together with close, fr or close friends and neighbors from Italy, and I would like to thank uh, Italy for the initiative, especially to Ambassador in Ljubljana, as well as School of Humanities uh, and Social Science from uh, University from Morocco, as well as Chatham House, uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs from the United Kingdom, and uh, that includes a diverse group of bright young people, and I see many of you here, and I count uh, on, I'm delighted to listen to you and hearing from you, what's your take on this very important topic we are dealing with today. Um, I mentioned this because it's important, not only because we share common uh, interests and challenges, but also common values in the Mediterranean but also because we are convinced that young leaders can 
importantly contribute to the future political processes to make our planet safer and better place. What we need, what we need uh, is a positive narrative, and I believe that the young generation can be a very important partner in making the world better and safer in the future. One of our main challenges, of course, is migration is not from today. Uh, migration was and will remain a challenge on a long run. It's a global problem requiring global solutions. Uh, in order to change the migration dynamic, uh, I believe we have to establish a new paradigm, uh, the positive perspective for the young generations especially through education and jobs, as well as through active involvement into the political processes. The young people could be drivers of positive transformation of society, and I believe that education, inclusiveness, and empowerment are the key to this end. Slovenia believes, and I would like uh, to underscore these principles, that uh, it is important, if not imperative, to globally cooperate on, on the issue of migration, which is why we support its so-called Global Compact on Migration uh, with the title Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration that was adopted in December 2018. In my case, I myself participated at negotiations in New York, and I believe that this document creates the first UN-wide and comprehensive framework to efficiently tackle migration and its root causes, thus providing sustainable and prosperous living conditions, ensuring security, good governance, rule of law, respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and thus providing sustainable development. Within the, within the European Union, Slovenia shows solidarity with the member states to the limits of its capacity and ability. With participation in the relo relocation scheme, in the voluntary resettlement scheme, military ship Triglau took part in Sofia operation in Mediterranean. Police officers are deployed to the borders of North Macedonia, of Serbia. Slovenia has accepted migrants rescued by the humanitarian ships in Mediterranean, so we took five from Malta and five from Italy. Uh, notwithstanding uh, the gravity and the importance of the situation in Mediterranean, I would like to, uh, to draw your attention to the Western Balkan migration route. We believe that this route is crucial for Slovenia. This year, migration pressure on Slovenia's southern border has increased again. Uh, Frontex came with uh, some data that, uh, that speaks for itself. Uh, there is an increase for 70 percent. Slovenia is sustaining the pressure and thus contributing and sharing the burden. It is determined to continue to support the countries along the Western Balkan route and will remain a credible partner on migration matters. With regard to the Western Balkans um, migration route, let me mention the Slovenian initiative, Positive Agenda for Youth in the Western Balkans. It is based on the awareness that there was no reconciliation in the region. Youth unemployment is extremely worrying. Young people are leaving the region and extremism is in rising. Recently, I visited Albania, and I had the privilege uh, speaking with the foreign minister, Bushati, former, former minister. And he told me that 100,000 people a year leave Albania. 100,000 people, mostly young people. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's untenable for a country. And I said to him, you know, in 20 years, Albania will be empty territory if this process continues. This is a worrying process, and we have, we have to take a very decisive step to prevent that kind of massive uh, migration. But it's not only Albania. There are other Western Balkan countries which are 
sharing the same problems and destiny. We believe that investing in young people in the region is actually investing in future European Union interlocutors, hoping that those countries will become sooner or later members of European Union. Of course, providing that they will, of course, fulfill the so-called Copenhagen criteria and will become a reliable partners within the European Union. I'm telling you this because it highlights the perspective of young people, the importance of providing opportunities for success, employment, and life in the countries of the region, as well as providing adequate education and European Union experience. It emphasizes also positive alternative for the young through existing programs of educational mobility, vocational training, and what is even more important, people-to-people -people contacts on a daily basis. Distinguished participants, Slovenia is also an active member of the Union for the Mediterranean. One of its priorities is the Slovenian-based Euro-Mediterranean University, so-called the MUNI, that connects uh, more than 130 universities around the Mediterranean. Since, um, I guess, June 2015, it has been operating also a MUNI Center for Arab, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies. Emuni covers themes and areas which are significant for European Euro-Mediterranean area. We believe that awareness rising of the young about all forms of intolerance and discrimination gives a valuable contribution towards a more tolerant society. Embracing diversity, ensuring equality, and promoting and safeguarding human rights of each individual are the most powerful tools to empower young people. Currently, MUNI provides master's degree program in the second Bologna program, business communication in an intercultural environment, and master's program, entrepreneurship and innovation in the Euro-Mediterranean area. Together with our ministry, uh, EMUNI organized uh, also shorter educational events, like recent ones on blue growth for young professionals from Euro-Mediterranean region, and roundtable on the promotion of active intercultural citizenship among young people in the Mediterranean. The events are primarily part of the positive agenda of youth for youth in the Mediterranean and a few other uh, institutions uh, which are part of this projects. Another area I would like to mention of our cooperation with the Union of, uh, for the Mediterranean is uh, creativity. Slivina will host the second creative forum, Ljubljana, from November 12 to 15. It brings together international cultural and cre creative industry, industries and is an opportunity to transfer good practices. Besides uh, respect to ministers from Western Balkans and the Southern Mediterranean representatives of the European Union institutions and international organizations, there will be also representatives of the, of the creative centers and young creatives, uh, creative entrepreneurs. Today, today's roundtable is about listening and learning from you, and of course from distinguished panelists and understanding how we can jointly engage better in the future. You represent and you present the future of our society and thus needs that continued attention of policy shapers. We believe that empowering the youth is a key element in addressing the root causes of migration, therefore investing in youth Offering your knowledge and positive altern alternatives is enhancing your opportunities in your lives, both in economic and political spheres, and should be in the center of our efforts for our prosperous future. I thank you for your invitation and uh, wish you, of course, a very creative and productive meeting today. Thank you very much indeed.
So, good morning, everybody. Uh, many thanks uh, for being with us today. Let me first uh, thank uh, Ambassador Logar and Ambassador Pichido for their kind and uh, encouraging words, uh, particularly for mentioning uh, some uh, government-led uh, initiatives, uh, which also, as they have uh, underlined, uh, involve uh, uh, drug attractors that indeed can help uh, advance uh, regional cooperation in the Mediterranean and elsewhere in Europe, which is indeed one of the key topics we would like to address in this conference. My name is Ecole Greco, I'm the uh, Vice, uh, Executive Vice President of the Instituto of Fai International, International Affairs Institute in Rome. I, must, uh, I would like to say that this is my second time in BLED. It's a really a great pleasure. Uh, in my view, that the Black Strategic Forum uh, is no doubt one of the most important uh, uh, annual international meetings devo devoted to a comprehensive and updated strategic uh, debate on crucial policy issues. And in particular, uh, I would underline the, its uh, youth dimension uh, has been uh, uh, for us uh, uh, and also in other European countries, a source of inspiration for similar uh, youth center activity. And I wish uh, particularly uh, to congratulate the Center for European Perspective for uh, its uh, excellent work. I've seen the agenda of uh, this year um, conference, youth conference, uh, has been uh, uh, very rich and stimulating. But uh, um, I also want to express my uh, warmest thanks to the Center for European Perspective for its key contribution and support for the organization of today's meeting. Not less important the support that we have received from the Italian Embassy. The original idea of this meeting was of, uh, uh, came from Ambassador Pichido and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of Slovenia and, and Italy. This meeting is part of a project called uh, New Med. Uh, it's a project uh, that our institute has been uh, conducting since 2014 with the support of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a private Italian foundation, the Compagnia di San Paolo, and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE. Uh, NewMed is a research uh, a network of Mediterranean experts uh, and analysts. Uh, we focus on one hand on the social, political and security related dynamics in the Mediterranean and on the other on the role of multilateral, regional and some regional organization in addressing the Mediterranean challenges. Uh, at one point of departure in 2014, in full uh, agreement with the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was uh, indeed the conviction that the role of international organizations in fostering uh, regional cooperation should be, had, had, had be profoundly reconsidered and uh, perhaps the OIC uh, itself could offer useful lessons in this regard. If not the model, this is perhaps too much, but at least uh, some uh, uh, experiences uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, cooperation instrument that may be considered uh, uh, and uh, applied to the Mediterranean context. Let me emphasize uh, three main features <coughs> of the NUMED, NUMED project very briefly. First, uh, the NUMED is a track to initiative. It involves both scholars, uh, independent analysts, and policy makers. Uh, we, aim, uh, we aim to provide key input to the political dialogue on the Mediterranean issues, uh, the dialogue that takes place uh, in the political forum, and particularly in the context of the OSCE. As you uh, probably know, the OSCE has developed uh, a so-called uh, Mediterranean dialogue with a group of, south, of six South Mediterranean countries. Second, and a closely uh, related point, our effort uh, has been to combine academic with policy-oriented research. Third, we try to, uh, we try, we try to, to distance ourselves to shy away from any Eurocentric approach. 
This implies, in particular, taking in due account uh, the interest, uh, interest perceptions and peculiarities of South Mediterranean countries. Uh, this point, this last point in particular, is linked to our conviction that uh, any new plan for regional cooperation to be successful must be based on credible co-ownership, so uh, common uh, responsibility, shared share responsibility between the two rims of the Mediterranean. The fact is, as you know, that past uh, uh, regional cooperation attempts have indeed failed to meet this uh, fundamental requirement. Of course, the European Union and US remain key actors in the region, but uh, we must recognize that other external actors, such as China and Russia, have become increasingly influential. And this requires discussing the prospect of convergence, possible, possibly joint action between those players, which indeed have quite different uh, geopolitical interests uh, to help address uh, the many uh, destabilizing conflict in the region. Uh, I would say from a European perspective, uh, it has become increasingly futile to look at the Mediterranean as sort of Mare Nostrum. There is a, a reference uh, to this concept uh, which, uh, which we would like to, uh, to develop uh, in a critical way uh, because uh, uh, has become uh, increasingly obsolete in, in our view. It's clear that the impact of global trends on the region cannot be underestimated. Also, we cannot ignore the growing geopolitical links between, for instance, North Africa and Sahel, or the wide-ranging implication for the mounting tensions in the Gulf region for the whole, uh, for the whole Mediterranean region. Therefore, uh, this is uh, point, uh, the need for an integrated approach capable of examining uh, the geopolitical links between the various sub-regions. This is an issue I think uh, that we will we'll have the opportunity to discuss in this conference. As you may have seen from the agenda, we will we'll have two sessions. The first will focus mostly on recent uh, geopolitical developments in North Africa and in the Middle East and the Gulf, with uh, an eye to the interplay between domestic and foreign policy, the role of external actors, but also non-state actors. A uh, security issue, in particular, will be at the center of our discussion. In the second session, we will continue this discussion, but also want uh, more specifically uh, to look into the prospect of relaunching regional cooperation in different policy domains. Uh, various formats, uh, as you know, of uh, um, international cooperation in the regions uh, are still active, uh, promoted by the EU, NATO, the OEC itself, but we must uh, acknowledge and recognize that this, uh, this the impact of those uh, security and cooperation arrangement have been fairly limited. So the problem remains if new forms of cooperation can be uh, attempted, possible with a more prominent role for local actors. So the menu of the issue we want to discuss, uh, I must say, is rather rich. But we have the privilege of having with us uh, uh, leading uh, experts uh, we, who will uh, introduce the, the two sessions. I wish to thank uh, all of them for having accepted our uh, invitation and I very much uh, look forward to our discussion. So uh, I think now without further ado we can uh, start immediately uh, the, the first session who will be introduced uh, by two leading Mediterranean experts. Uh, professor Jalil Lunas, uh, Professor of International Relations uh, in Iran, Iran and Morocco. Uh, he has been involved, uh, uh, especially in the last few years, in numerous uh, European projects uh, on the future of the Mediterranean region. And he is currently uh, coordinating uh, an important uh, research team on preventing violent conflict. Uh, he's a security expert, has studied intensively, in particular, the conflict dynamics in the Maghreb, with its links with the Sahel region, 
the development of jihadist movement and the radicalization processes in, in those regions. Uh, the second uh, speaker is Nier Pillam, Associate Fellow at the Middle East and North Africa Program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House uh, in London. Uh, he uh, has uh, worked for many years at Chatham House, I think for, since uh, 2014, and is all now also the CEO of the uh, Cassidy uh, as associate, which is a consultancy uh, with uh, specialized particularly on the Gulf region. So, Professor Linus, you have to go. So, uh, I, I'd like to ask all of you to uh, stay within the time limit of 10 minutes because we want to have then enough time for the, uh, this. <coughs> Thank you uh, for inviting me. I uh, hope I can negotiate two more minutes. Anyways, I'm just uh, so okay. All right. So um, thank you for inviting me. It's my first time here in Blood, and uh, thank you for being here. So North Africa. North Africa is a very uh, complex regional system with many threats and many challenges when it comes to uh, security. Uh, we have at least one failed state, which is Libya, which, uh, with all the security concerns that we have in such situations. We have uncertainty when it comes to security with uh, Algeria, because of the future. We don't know with all what's going on right now in Algeria, what will be the future. Uh, what will be the future. We have terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda and uh, the Islamic State. We have as well the phenomenon of the foreign fighters, North Africa, uh, in terms of uh, foreign fighters, have provided uh, over uh, 7,000 foreign fighters to the Middle East, which is the second largest number in terms of the regions after uh, the Soviet, former Soviet republics. Uh, to that extent, if you want, we have important security challenges in the region. So let's start in addition to uh, migra illegal migration, human trafficking, especially from Libya. To that extent, let's first start with terrorism. When it comes to terrorism, we have first Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda has been present in North Africa now for several years, and uh, it's very present through its uh, local branch, which is Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb uh, is currently present, supposedly present in three countries, Algeria, Libya, uh, Algeria Tunisia, and Libya. In Algeria itself. In Algeria itself, uh, Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb is considered today, the month we speak, as basically uh, being destroyed. Why? Between 1999 and 2013, basically, the government in Algeria has followed a policy called National Reconciliation, which basically offers uh, amnesty to the terrorists who want to surrender, but as well, if you want to repress those who refuse. It's a combination of both. It worked, it, worked, it worked really well in the sense that Algerian uh, regime, was, uh, the Algerian security services, were able to restore security in most of the country. In two, starting from 2013-2014, there was a reversal of the security strategy in Algeria towards jihadi organizations, uh, basically to return what we can call to the strategies of eradication. Between 2014-2018, the Algerian army has launched huge military operations all over the country, which led to the elimination of something like 1,000 jihadists in the country. So at the moment we speak right now, the moment we speak right now, uh, last time I was in Algeria doing field work and I interviewed a lot of people, they considered that the terrorist organization Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb in Algeria is not uh, basically uh, deceased, but are considered almost as such. You have still some very few groups that are present in uh, eastern Algeria, close to the Tunisian borders, but almost, uh, but very ineffective, very, very ineffective. Tunisia. In Tunisia, Al-Qaeda has been present through its branch called Arba ibn Nafeh, which is also uh, an affiliate of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Now, this terrorist organization, this organization as well, has been uh, limited to the borders between Algeria and Tunisia. Very, it has been contained. Uh, it was active between 2012-2016-17. The Tunisian security, security services, with the support of Algerian security services and others, have been able to contain the threats and to basically keep it at the algerian tunisian borders. The, the, the brigade of Babunaf is still active, can hear from time to time from attacks, but it's not anymore a threat as it was, uh, it was in the past, between 2011 and 2015. Libya. Libya is a little bit different. Libya is a little bit different. The Canada was very present in, uh, since 2011, has been very present there uh, since 2011. However, however, between 2014-2016, the, the, the Benghazi government and the Triple government have basically struck uh, struck at those uh, this organization, and basically it has retreated to southern Libya. Southern Libya. 
The problem, and I'll get back to it if we have a more minute, it's the, pro the problem is that the civil war between the government of Tripoli and the government of Benghazi, which basically sh shifted the attention of those two, uh, two uh, governments uh, to fight each other instead of continuing to fight the Qaeda organization in Libya. That extent, if you want, for the past one year, basically, which basically, over the past eight months, uh, which basically coincides with the offensive of Khalifa Haftar against Tripoli, we have witnessed a sort of resurgence of Qaeda, especially in southern Libya. The Islamic State. When it comes to the Islamic State, when the Islamic State has been present, was present in Algeria between 2014 and 2015. Here, the Algerian security services uh, basically put the maximum pressure against uh, the Islamic State affiliate in Algeria, which was called at the time Jun Khilafan, the soldiers of the Caliph. And they basically cracked down on it. It was, it was, it was a manhunt. I, was, uh, I, I interviewed several people who were there. There was a literally a manhunt against them. And, this, and they were able to very quickly dismantle this organization. We have similar pattern in Tunisia. Tunisia again here, Jun Khilafa, which is again the affiliate of uh, the Islamic State in uh, Tunisia. Here, there was an attempt as well to do the same thing in Tunisia, but it did not work as well as it did in Algeria. Tunisia, that it were able to contain, limit, and weaken this organization, but not completely suppress it. So again, we hear from time to time from attacks on the part of the Islamic State in Libya. It was again not as strong as 2014, 2016, but still it's there. Libya. Libya was probably, after Libya was where the Islamic State has been, was able to establish its most powerful affiliate in the world after the Middle East, the Middle East. Uh, between 2014 and 2016. It's where they took um, control of a large chunk of the ter territory. Now again, as you all know, between 2015, 16, 17, the Libyan government and again Al Ghazi basically launched massive attacks with support of the international community against the Islamic State in Libya. It was direct, because it was a direct threat as well to Europe, Southern Europe. Again here, it was able to push the Islamic State to southern Libya. The Islamic State lost its territories in northern Libya and retreated to southern Libya. However, very much like I just said about uh, Al-Qaeda, the same thing happened for the Islamic State. But they did something, they retreated to southern Libya and regrouped. Taking advantage of this ongoing fighting between uh, Haftar and, uh, Haftar and uh, the government in Tripoli, they have been able to revive themselves in the past few months. Now, so what, what is uh, very dangerous is that there have been rumors, information, it's not clear. It's not clear, but there are even talks about a possible cooperation between the two organizations. It's not, uh, it's not uh, yet clear what is going on or not, but apparently there are very uh, the strong rumors that the two organizations, Qaeda and the ISIS in Libya, are coming or trying to get some uh, work together, which is very much different from what we have witnessed in the, uh, the, middle, the middle East. The foreign fighters, the issue of foreign fighters here is also very different. We have the, between 2011 and 2015, something like seven, over 7,000 foreign fighters went to, uh, went to the Middle East. Half of them have been killed, and we have like something like 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 have returned to their, the country. Now, what is specific here is that they have surrendered, basically. They have returned to their home countries and surrendered, Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya. Now, here we don't have that many foreign fighters, but in Tunisia we have like 1,000 foreign fighters that have basically surrendered themselves to the authorities. Similar pattern in Morocco. One of the things that the local, the local authorities have done, which is well, which is good, it's that basically try to reach out to those foreign fighters who were in the Middle East and telling them basically offering them sort of a way out. You can return home, you will go to jail, you will spend 10, 15 years in jail depending on your level of involvement in the organization, but if you cooperate with us, if you work with us and so on, we will offer you a way out. It's better than stay in the Middle East and get killed over there. To the extent, if you want, this strategy, this policy has somehow worked. It has allowed to do it. many, uh, many uh, ex foreign fighters chose this option and decided to return to their home countries. I was able to interview several of them, one, uh, several of them and they told me that basically, yes, uh, it was a mess in Middle East Syria. They've seen Syria was a mess. And actually, uh, they were very, I mean, they just decided to use this way out and to return to their home countries. Now, uh, there's this risk when you talk about this, about the possible return of the foreign fighters, but here to go to Libya, to continue the jihad, to continue the fight, and so on. So far, the moment we speak, we have not seen uh, such a situation. I mean, there are uh, rumors here and there, but uh, we do not expect uh, mass migration of foreign fighters to Libya to continue the jihad. Um, finally, finally, uh, uncertainty of Algeria, uncertainty of when we talk about Algerian future. Um, 
for the time being, at the moment we speak, we have not seen any, I mean, yes, there is protocol with the Sabati, with the demonstration and so on, but come with security deployment, the uh, army and so on. For the time being, at the moment we speak, the army has not shifted uh, its security deployments, maintained its status all over the country. Uh, but extent we and uh, we do not expect any shift or change at this future. We have not witnessed a weakening or collapse of the state as such. Institutions you have a real pro political problem, but for the time being, the, uh, the, the apparatus, security apparatus, uh, has remained in place, confirming the borders, providing security, and so on. But to extent we do not, uh, we have not witnessed what happened elsewhere in similar situations. So for the time being, at least when we speak. So uh, I don't know if I have more. Moment. Okay. Um, okay. That's an overview. So for the for time being, I mean, the situation remains, uh, say, more or less stable. We have some uncertainties, uncertainties about the future. But I mean, for the time being, at least, it's uh, there is a sort of status quo. We don't know what the future is made of, but uh, it's uh, well. Many things. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to come and speak here. It's my very first time in Bladen, my first time in Slovenia, so I'm, I'm delighted to, to be with you. I'm always very nervous if I'm introduced as an expert, because I feel that uh, I'm still very much a student, and I'm still very much sort of learning uh, on, a, on a daily basis, so I think that, that, that's a common experience for, for all of us. Um, I'm really pleased to, to address you as, as an audience today because in my role at Chatham House, um, I work on a project that we've been running now for the past five years called Future Dynamics in the Gulf. And it's very much, um, the, the project was conceived because we, we felt that too much analysis, too much research focused on sort of senior leadership across the Gulf where we would watch you know, which leaders were about to die, who were about to pass on, and we thought we have to really sort of get you know, much deeper down into society. And as a consequence of that, we've been building networks with, with young leaders, with what we call next generation <coughs> young leaders across the Gulf. And uh, that's very much sort of at, at the heart of what we do. What I want to do in my remaining nine minutes is, is try to sort of pack together um, a, very, a very sort of simple concept, um, bringing together lots of different factors, and hopefully in the Q&A session we can unpack that. Obviously I can't address everything in, in, in those few minutes. What I want to really do is, I don't want to describe because we're, we're aware of the actions of the Gulf Arab states, and that and primarily mean the uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. We know of their um, actions throughout North Africa, uh, since 2011 and before, in fact, what I want to do is really sort of highlight what's driving their different positions, should we say, across the region. And I think the best way of, of encapsulating that is to unpack what I would say are, are two very different visions that Qatar and its allies and, and that its partners have, and the vision that Saudi Arabia and the Emirates has. has. And I also want to do, put a little bit of context behind that. Very simplistically, um, we have a very strong alliance between Saudi Arabia and UAE. We have a very strong alliance between the um, crown princes in both of those countries, uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Zayed in um, the UAE. Ever since the Arab uprisings, and ever since they felt that there was perhaps potentially a threat uh, from within their own countries, within their own communities, because they were unaware of, um, they were concerned that the Arab uprisings that took place elsewhere in the region may have a spillover effect in, in their country. They very much sort of, those two countries very much sort of formed a closer and a strong, solid bond. With the shift in leadership in Saudi Arabia in particular, um, we've seen this growing dynamic, this, this, this closeness in the relationship. And we've seen Mohammed bin Zayed, I'm going to call MBZ from now on, just to keep it short. We've seen MBZ almost sort of put his arm around Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, and say, this is the vision, this is the future for our region. And that vision looks like this. I'm going to use some strange words. It's a secular vision where we push aside political Islam, 
throughout the region. We govern through secular lens. We have a strong authoritarian state. And we'll build an alliance of states that can create a relatively strong axis that pushes against political Islam and is more in keeping and more in line, we might think, with, I guess, a Chinese model of governance. And that alliance of states looks like this. Um, UAE, Saudi Arabia, throw, in the, throw into the mix Israel. Israel is part of this. It's not part of an axis, but it's certainly part of that thinking. Egypt, we've seen support to Egypt. And then Libya through Haftar. This is quite a strong axis. This is one vision for the region. This is one that's been driven, um, I'd say, by those two key players. On the other side, this, this was sort of almost in response to Qatar's projection of power ever since the mid-90s. You'll all be familiar that Qatar's um, rich gas resources were first mined and um, exploited successfully from 95, 96 onwards, and Qatar, this tiny little state which wanted to push itself out of the shadows of its dominant neighbor, Saudi Arabia, started to project itself very furtively, very actively into the political arena, gave itself quite a prominent role, um, set up Al Jazeera, of course, and that was, that was one key way of pushing its messages, but also engaged deeply in um, helping resolve conflicts in the region. By the time the Arab uprisings came, Qatar saw a different vision for the region. It saw itself almost as a sponsor of what it would call democratic change. It saw itself as a sponsor or recognized an ability where it could project its power and put itself in the front seat of change in those countries. So here you have it, you have Qatar, um, who has now been blockaded by the Remain, well, by, by Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the other Gulf Arab states, but not to the same extent. On one side of the fence, you have Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the other side of the fence. And you have a very strong division, a deep, deep division, um, that sees the region in two very different ways. Now the questions that people like myself ask when I'm selling the think tank in London is how sustainable is this division in the region? How can these visions, these competing visions, uh, play out or how can they be reconciled? We've started to see now, so for some time, uh, we've started to wonder at what point would this relationship, this buoyant relationship between MBZ and MBS start to well, come, come and done. How could a country the size of Saudi Arabia allow itself to be sort of cajoled, pushed by a much smaller, more nimble state? Or we saw Qatar really, you could say, punching above its weight for quite a long time and projecting its power. And after the Arab uprisings, was Qatar was very much seen, I would say, by, by, by many Western states as a, as, as a darling state, as a darling for change, because it provided a, a fig leaf for, um, for intervention, we could say. Qatar very, very quickly became a, a toxic brand. Um, it lost a lot of its appeal in the West. And what we're starting to see now, obviously, in, in Yemen, is a very similar thing with the Emirates. The Emirates and Saudi are deeply engaged in that war in Yemen, which, which is the largest and worst humanitarian disaster known to, his, known, known to, to, to humankind. Um, we see them projecting power throughout the Horn of Africa, um, certainly sort of spreading their influence there. And we've, see, and we've seen their influence throughout North Africa, but primarily uh, breaking the arms embargo in Libya. So you almost have this sort of shape where, where you saw Qatar sort of coming up very positively, being seen as an important player, sort of with, with significant political capital that, that, it, that it acquired and gained, and then becoming kind of toxic and losing that. And then the Emirates were almost picking up, <coughs> itself becoming the darling 
of the international community. We've put its special forces in Afghanistan. It's put its funding in, in countries in Africa. It's sort of stood in lockstep with many of the Western powers and pushed and promoted a, a strong sort of sense, sense of secularism. But at the same time, it's now, I think, in danger of overreach, in the same way that Qatar overreached itself. And we may start to sort of see a dip, a dip down there and a building frustration. But in a way, this is, this is at the heart, I would say, this, this struggle between this vision of where Qatar sits and how it sees its, its region. And of course, we can't talk about Qatar without thinking about its growing relations with Turkey. That's an important axis, this is too strong a word. But that's a very important partnership. You can see those pulling together very, very tightly. And somewhere within that orbit, of course, we can't talk about that. the Gulf that talking about Iran. Iran sort of sits somewhere in there. It's not, it's not an ally of uh, either one of those states in any strong way, but it sort of sits in that axis. So in the Gulf, you have two axes at the moment, or two different visions. One that sees Saudi, the Emirates, Egypt, uh, Israel sat in there, and the plan would be ultimately for, for, for Libya to sit within that frame. And on the other side, you have Turkey, you have um, Iran, and you have Qatar sort of in, in the driving seat. Those are two competing visions, and they play out in North Africa. So many thanks. Uh, thanks for putting so many interesting, stimulating issues uh, on the table, and also for being uh, so disciplined in uh, respecting uh, the time limits. Uh, so the floor now is open for questions, uh, uh, brief interventions. Uh, so we should have, uh, I think, a flying microphone. Good morning. Good morning, and uh, thank you for your having um, uh, the uh, My name is Giorgio Tichio, and uh, I'm a master student in security studies at the Università di Trento. And um, so thank you for your um, very brief speeches and uh, very insightful. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you said that uh, Saudi Arabia and say the Saudi axis is trying to project a secular vision. But don't you think that uh, ultimately the, the visions and these struggles uh, that you have identified between these two opposing axes are strongly underpinned by, as I said, religious and deeply mm, different ideological visions in terms of religion, and that they're instead uh, in these struggles trying to project uh, policies which are more reflective of uh, their own, let's say, religious standings? Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is why I said when I, when I described it as secular, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 um, it's a difficult word to, to sort of... Shocking. Shocking, yes. <laughs> put, put into that frame. For sure, the, the Emirates, who I see at, at the moment as the senior partner in that relationship and, and how it's driving the axis, how it's driving that partnership, has a very strong secular uh, vision for the region. It sees very much sees religion as sort of being on the side. This is something one does at home, or this is this this, this is something on the side. No, absolutely. I mean, obviously, from Saudi Arabia, you know, custodian of the two holy places, religion is absolutely central. It's a it's a, it's a part of everyday life. Domestically, we see some changes to that. We see some pushback on that. I mean, that's a, if, if that project were to ever really take root, that's going to be a long, slow process. That's not going to happen very, very quickly. We have seen a number of moves and a number of measures um, by MBS to um, push some of the more sort of, I guess, political dimensions and some of the more social dimensions away from the public arena. But for the time being, Saudi Arabia is not really in the business of projecting its religious power. I don't, I, don't, I don't see that. I see it being much more closely aligned with the Emirates and trying to push a model where it, it sees its interests 
so, so defining interest rather than religion, sees its interest much better served by pushing a model that is more um, appropriate and more akin to, to, to what the international community sees. So it's not necessarily doing that. There are aspects, if we look at the Maldives, there are certainly, um, you know, we've seen in Afghanistan over the years, some of those activities continue, and there are charities that, that continue to promote and push a religious discourse, certainly. But, but I would say, the, as a state actor, and this is where the driver is, is there is a much more sort of secular sense to what it's trying to achieve across the region. And there is also, and this is a long process, and there will be some pushback, and it may fail, but there is also um, a, you know, a goal to sanitize political Islam as well. I think that's, that's part of the drive, but that is something that's been driven and been driven for quite some time by, by Muhammad, Muhammad bin Zayed. But the relationship between those two and the relationship between those countries, I mean, I can't forecast and I can't see into the future, but I hope to say at some point, you know, there will be a point of departure and that may well be part of it. I have a question for Dr. Jalil Prunas. I hope I pronounced it well. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that uh, the situation is stable in the region. Uh, it caught my attention that you didn't mention Syria and uh, the war in Syria is going into its ninth year. So I was wondering what your view is on this. Hello, my name is Rafal. I'm here from the Young BSF Forum. I would have a question to both participants here. Thank you very much for the presentation. Considering the instability in North Africa um, caused by um, factors such as terrorism, as mentioned, how do you realistic, uh, realistic do you see the EU migration deal from June 29th, from 2018, which foresees setting up asylum processing centers across North Africa, trying to stem migration flow to the EU? Thank you. Um, so on the question of uh, legitimacy, yeah, and religious religious religion. Religion. With religious legitimacy, I mean it's such it's it's su such an unknown, um, and it and it's something I guess as as, as observers, as analysts, as, as researchers, we we're, we're constantly looking and constantly trying to better understand what these shifts or what these changes mean. I mean I don't I don't think that uh, NBS is really trying to certainly not trying to deconstruct religion and, and, and faith in the country, I mean, it's much too important, it's much too significant, but I think there are areas where, where he and the team around him see that you know, the country has to make this transition away from oil, and ultimately the long-term interests of the state or the long-term interests of the family are making and helping that transition take place, and he has probably seen, you know, generations, or he's seen, you know, his predecessors who've talked about diversification um, ever since the 70s and the need for it, um, but, but going absolutely nowhere. So, so what, how, how, I, how I see what he's doing domestically is um, he's trying to curtail some of the extreme is a hard word, I don't want it in the extreme sense, but the, the more extreme manifestations of, 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 of faith in the country that can constrain or restrain economic growth and can restrain youth moving into the, into the market space. So I, I, it's, it's, it's not bringing about profound change, but, but it's creating a space in which uh, the economy can, can grow. So for example, things like getting the, 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 you know, the religious police off the streets makes that environment a little bit more comfortable. Um, and now, um, Allowing shops to open during prayer time. These are, you know, these, these are all sort of instrumental steps, I guess, to sort of freeing, freeing up the economy. But he's not going to walk away and suddenly say, no, I'm not going to hold this. If I become king, I'm, I'm not going to be the custodian of the two other places, and we're going to change how. I mean, that's that's an instrumental and an absolutely key part. But but it's sort of it's 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 playing at the edges. But also it's also from a foreign policy perspective. It's, it, it's trying to shift the narrative away from necessarily supporting states or exporting, which, you know, exporting extremism, if you like, which, which they did throughout the 80s and, and, and the 90s. It, it's trying to recalibrate that. That's, that's where it sits. But religious legitimacy is absolutely critical um, to the country and, and how that's managed. And we're also watching and waiting to see you know, 
when, when is the pushback come? When, when is that coming? You know, when, when we see clerics that are very senior clerics with very large followings that are being held to the present and, and mm -hmm. may, may be executed, we wonder when, you know, when is the shift coming? When, when is that kind of pushback coming? Um, we, don't have, we don't have the answers to that. In Yemen, no, absolutely. I mean, I think I think there's a real, you know, there's a real difference. I mean, Saudi Arabia wants Yemen to remain united. I don't think the Emirates are entirely fussed about having Yemen uh, united. I think they would be probably quite happy if uh, if the STC were to you know, to break away and there was an independent southern Yemen. I think that I think that would give the Emirates um, something very very you know. Very strong, and that that would support. I haven't we can't really talk about that. But the sort support the Emirates' vision for creating strategic depth. One of the lessons I think it learned from Qatar was Qatar never built or developed strategic depth in the region. Uh, you know, it simply projected its power out, um, and this meant that when when the brand became toxic, you know, it lost a lot of support internationally and had to sort of come back home and recalibrate, which the Qatar has done pretty well. Um, but the Emirates are projecting that they're building their bases right throughout the Horn of Africa. You know, like, if they're playing with Socotra. They would love to have Southern Yemen. This is all about strategic depth because the Emirates is geographically so, so, so small. And the other thing is, I think it's clear that, I mean, MBZ is quite a strategic thinker. I mean, he, you know, he thinks long term and he does That's have to. The acronym is not. Oh, oh, okay. So, so Mohammed bin Zayed, um, the, the, the Crown Prince of um, the United Arab Emirates, has a very has a very clear vision of where he wants his country to go, and, and he's you know, he's a strategic thinker. And when Mohammed bin Salman became Crown Prince in, in, in Saudi Arabia, he saw a young apprentice here that, that he could work with and mold and shape. Um, but he started to recalibrate his understanding of Mohammed bin Salman. Mohammed bin Salman has, has clearly made a number of blunders domestically uh, and internationally. And I think Mohammed bin Zayed is now starting to see him maybe as a, as a liability. And so, so there is, that relationship is unlikely to endure you know, for, over, over the long term. Thank you for the uh, questions. Uh, now to relate it back. Uh, if you noticed, I've talked about North Africa, not the Middle East. So that's why we mentioned Syria. Uh, when I said, I said stabilize, and we say stability. Stabilize means that for the time being, and the moment we speak, the situation has been more or less stabilized there. But uh, when it comes to security wise, Tunisia and Algeria, for example. In Libya, uh, as I said, in Libya, we still have a lot of problems and it's full of uncertainties. The bit full of uncertainty. Politically speaking, Algeria, the future is complex, we don't know. But from security wise point of view, security point of view, Algerian Army and Security Service have maintained their uh, strategies and policies that have been in place in the past 20 years for the time being. So that's why I'm talking about uh, the situation has been stabilized, but I don't know about the future. But Syria, uh, I didn't mention Syria at all in my presentation because again it's not my uh, focus area of focus. I don't know if it answers your question from this point of view. Uh, when it comes to migration, my, uh, the agreement in 2018, I believe that uh, the idea for the European Union was to establish hubs in Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and to prevent uh, migration to, uh, to Europe, basically to go there. Uh, my understanding is that Algeria has refused uh, to do this. Morocco and Tunisia uh, has, uh, I think Tunisia has accepted, but Morocco eventually has refused, I think I'm wrong, is correct, but it has been negatively perceived in all three countries in any ways. It's been rejected, it's been very negatively perceived. Uh, by the populations and to a lesser extent by the authorities, especially in Morocco, uh, because uh, it was perceived as if the European Union is subcontracting, sub if you want, uh, the problem of uh, migration to those countries. You know, like I pay you, do you deal with it? It's not our business. And, it was, and uh, for several reasons, it was really, really, really negatively uh, perceived. It was, I think it was a wrong initiative, at least. Uh, the way it was put, at least. The way it was put was really. Uh, well, frankly, in sense. So, uh, yeah, it was negatively uh, perceived. Uh, Algeria, as I said, like Algeria refused it altogether. I uh, think Morocco as well, if memory is correct. Morocco as well has actually refused Tunisia, I'm not sure about it. But in any case, not three countries because uh, negatively perceived, accepted or rejected, was negatively perceived.
it all time. Just a brief comment on that. Uh, uh, coming from a country that had, has experienced big difficulties uh, in reconciling the, the its, uh, crisis management effort uh, in Libya with uh, the need to, of course, contain uh, the migration flow through a reinforced cooperation with Libyan authorities of the legitimate government. So this effort has uh, caused many tensions in the country and has been exploited also by, for instance, uh, uh, General Haftar. And there has been a, a debate in the country, some reaction from, uh, from the people. Uh, so it, it, this is a constant uh, problem that we Europeans uh, have faced. The difficulty in uh, uh, convincing, uh, so having an effective uh, migration containment strategy which can be accepted by the government first, but also by the population. Because then it became, this initiative became part of the political debate, no? political conflict in the country. So this should be calibrated to be uh, uh, organized in a way that, so that is key element uh, then to not, uh, uh, in a way that not uh, instigate new tensions and provoke uh, additional divisions because it is a very, very big challenge. We have found a way, uh, effective way of um, uh, addressing this, uh, this basic dilemma. My name is Daniel Gheorghe. Uh, I'm an expert with the Total, Cent uh, Total Herzl Center of Israeli Studies uh, at the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration in Bucharest. Uh, I have a small comment for Mr. Quillen and a question. Uh, when you started to speak about this new secular vision, um, uh, the first question that I had was, as you mentioned, how will that sustain itself? Um, and uh, personally, I might be wrong, I have uh, serious doubts when it comes to the comparison with China. Uh, like if we see the political Islam as the uh, ideological pillar uh, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, let aside the fact that uh, when we talk about uh, radicalization and radical Islam in Europe, um, most of uh, these uh, actions uh, rely themselves on Wahhabi literature, mostly in Europe. Uh, and now uh, my question is, um, though if uh, this new vision, this new secular vision will somehow sustain itself, let's say in the next 38 years, um, should we expect uh, some warmer relations or between Israel and the Gulf states or at least a uh, reconfiguration of those relations in the region? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm glad we, you know, we, we come back to this term secular. Um, and, no, absolutely. I mean, core texts are, are used to, to, to radicalize, and I, mean, I, don't, I don't think the taps have been turned off in terms of what's projected. But just simply in um, dis describing the vision, I think that's that's where where the leadership is, at least in thinking. Okay, how how can we envisage this region in the next 20, 30 years? We want to marginalise Iran. We want to keep them pushed aside. We want to marginalise Turkey. Uh, Qatar. We don't care what happens to Qatar. We're happy to crush it, to squash it. This this is a vision in which we can project, and this is this is something we can work with. And. So Mohammed, I keep on coming back to Mohammed bin Zayed because I see him almost as the architect of this. Um, and I don't think he's this devious character, I mean, I think he's somebody who's... I mean, he was, in, in, in his youth, I mean, he was a strong proponent of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was a fervent believer in that. And then at some point he had this sort of epiphany, which I guess you can't really mix the two terms, but anyway, he had this, whatever it was, this vision. Um, and, and he turned his back on that. And I very much sort of see that he is... Um, you know, he's, he's trying to persuade Mohammed bin Salman that you know, the only way, really, to, you know, to move your country from here to here 
is, is, is to recalibrate and then to push this, this other vision. Um, how successful that is, I, I mean, I don't think it will be successful. And I don't think this alliance of states that I've described is going to be a strong alliance of states that's going to endure. There are a hundred reasons why that's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean that's not the vision that those particular leaders have at this particular time. So that's what I'm describing. In terms of relations with Israel, um, so, I mean, I've taken part in, you know, discussions when, when, when I've had Emirati colleagues and Israeli colleagues and Saudi colleagues around the table, and those relationships already exist. Um, they're not, I mean, they are kind of semi-public, but they're not really massively public. Um, Israeli counterparts, Israeli colleagues would love for Saudi Arabia or the Emirates to come out and just to be to make it very public and to have full diplomatic relations. That's not going to happen for, 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 for quite a long time, I don't think. But certainly, you know, we talk about intelligence sharing, we talk about tech sharing, we talk about companies operating in, in both spaces. Already those those relations are quite a, 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 a deep a, a deepening, certainly. And, and when one thinks about, you know, um, We've managed to get this far without mentioning Mr. Trump, which was great. I didn't want to use the Trump word, but I got there. Um, so the problem is, um, but you know, when we talk about the deal of the century, whatever whatever we think that is, um, and what it might not be, um, part of the sort of the groundwork, part of the thinking behind that, was very much, um, you know, pulling Mohammed bin Salman on board and getting him to be a little bit more forward leaning in terms of acknowledging that there's that relationship with Israel, and very much on the sideline in the Palestinian issue. So I, I, I mean, I, I see the relationship, there's, there's a huge amount of connectivity. We saw you know, Netanyahu visit Oman, um, whatever that was, a couple of months ago. That's, that's, that, that's quite alive, I think. Um, but getting it to look at the line where it becomes absolutely public, I think that's. I think that's going to take. You know, that's going to take some time. And in some of the testing, some of the thinking around that, you know, it's the old adage. Adage that can't happen until the Palestinian situation. I'm trying to find the right word. Is you know is is, is resolved, or there is you know so so we're going to, until until that point. And so the question has been, you know, does that have to be resolved? Does there have to be a resolution to that before that relationship can, can move ahead? And I think. Thank you. My name is Teresa Fallon. I'm with the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. Can you hear me? Um, thanks for this fascinating discussion. I, you mentioned connectivity, and I understand the region is so complex. But can you please comment on the impact of China on the region? How are they influencing the political, economic, and strategic calculus? And we do know they have long-term ideas for the region. So please comment. Thanks. This, this is something that um, I, I think about a lot, China moving into the region, and um, at, at China House we're trying to sort of work up a project where we, we can better understand or we, we, we can begin to map uh, the relationship. Um, I mean, China, as, as you said, China I think has a long-term plan, and that's got to be 50 years out. I think it's, you know, it's, I'd like to describe it, it's, it's moving to the region as slow, but I think, it's, I think that's picking up pace, and we can obviously that through the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I've taken part in a number of dialogues with uh, Chinese colleagues in Shanghai and, and Beijing where um, they have expressed a, a real desire, a real interest to engage diplomatically in some of the core issues. Um, Syria, for, for instance, um, the Israel-Palestine issue, you know, they, they've expressed interest. But, but I think for the time being, I think you know they're, they're sort of dipping, dipping their toes in. They're just sort of testing the waters, but primarily at the moment, I think it's it's an economic model that's that, that's driving their push into the region. It's a long, slow process. Um, as long as say in the Gulf, as long as the U.S. remains the primary security guarantor, that they can afford to bandwagon. At the moment, China has you know, good relations with Iran. China has good relations with Saudi Arabia. It doesn't want to spoil that. It doesn't want to take sides in that. Um, but I, I would say, over the, over the long term, I mean, it's you know, it's, it's clear that that relationship is is, is going to deepen and it's going to be quite instrumental. 
I, when, when I first joined Chatham House, um, I, I joined a colleague um, who, who was a British, former British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, and he'd been a former British ambassador to Israel. And he had accompanied um, some of the Saudi senior princes on a trip to Beijing. So this was about five or six years ago. And he said, you know, the, the Saudis were really looking to deepen that relationship. Um, but they came back really frustrated because they felt that, you know, this was her term, you know, China just really saw, you know, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf as a, as a gas station, as a petrol station. And they, they came back frustrated. However, having said that, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've sort of written about this a little bit in the past. I mean, the ties between the U.S. You know, or Europe and the U.S. and, 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 and the Gulf states, you know, it's deep. It, it runs very, very deeply. And there's strong institutional linkages and there's strong educational linkages and there's strong military linkages which, which tie that together. But, it, but if one maps it out, those, those relationships now from the Gulf Arab states, one can start to see the economic, their projection, certainly through the, through the energy lens, and there are increasing numbers of young Saudis, young Gulfers, going to live and study in, in Shanghai and Beijing and other parts of China. So I, so I think we're sort of in that transition period. It's going to take some time. Um, but certainly China's becoming a, a very important actor. And again, to come to this point about Mohammed bin Zayed being quite strategic, uh, I think he's taking positions throughout the Horn of Africa because he's very conscious and very aware that China has its base in Djibouti. Um, and as you know, he himself drew lessons, I think, from you know, the Arab uprisings, there was that surprise, there was that shock that, from, from, from the Gulf Arab perspective, that the rug was you know, drawn from under Mubarak's feet. So I, I think ever since then, the, calcul the calculation has been that the U.S. may not be a long, not going to be in the region for a very, very long time. It's, it's pivot. So therefore, we need to prepare for this interregnum where we have other powers coming into the region, um, and ultimately China is going to come in. So let's position ourselves right. I hope that answers you. Are there any other questions? Uh, we are speaking here about the Russian and the Mediterranean region as such, but uh, what we have heard is mainly here more about the Red Sea uh, region. To, to shift the, 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 the focus now to uh, the Mediterranean uh, region, uh, we, we could perceive the region as a laboratory for the uh, world order, because we have all the uh, different visions for the world order uh, coming together in this uh, condensed uh, space. We have uh, Islamic region of the world order, we have European, uh, American, uh, uh, Arabic, etc. And so now uh, China is uh, coming uh, into uh, the game. So my question is uh, what type of balance of power uh, is emerging in the Mediterranean region? Who are the main players and how this uh, uh, kind of balance of power can uh, ensure the regional uh, stability uh, in the near future, especially that also bringing into, into play the European Union. I, I would have uh, the question also, this question is also for Mr. Greco, because when we speak about the European Union, yes, on the one hand we have uh, uh, the European Union, but at the same time we see that Italy and France sometimes also diverge on, on, on the uh, uh, substantial topics in the region. Thank you. Any other question? If not, uh, and of course you have taken note of this uh, rather complicated question, uh, I would like to use my, uh, you allow, the privilege of our uh, uh, chairman to just ask a uh, final question to each of you. Uh, one that relates to, uh, to the legalization programs. You said that the government in the region have been uh, quite successful in implementing those programs. They are a calibration pro uh, problem to uh, deal with the problem of um, Rita and uh, the fighters. Uh, how, and then you also mentioned that the pressure from the EU and Western countries uh, also has been uh, instrumental has been in a sense defending them well. Uh, could you just elaborate on that? 
place that has been a, a, an interaction, you know, type of interaction between, uh, between Western countries, particularly European countries, and the local government in dealing with this issue. And how can this cooperation uh, develop? Uh, the second question is linked to the final question. Uh, is if you can shed light on the role of the Kentucky in, in the region, considering this the two competing uh, regions of geopolitical uh, lines. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, well, I start talked about it, uh, about the returnees, uh, the Algerian, Moroccan, Tunisian authorities have put in place. Uh, specific pro I mean, programs and strategies uh, which basically the idea is to bring back those who used who went there to try to get them back uh, put, in, put in place uh, um, put them in jail of course you, you go, it's like what they call the way out so one, one place to way out for you so you will go to jail but as well uh, we'll provide you you uh, will get, you will get follow, you will be followed you will be uh, in terms of social accompaniment you will have um, support you will as well um, but they, you always as well participate in uh, campaigning at the level of the society against the U, against the radical radicalization. So, which means basically that the, you've got situations where, for example, I witnessed that to ex former journalists will go and talk to the youth and tell them, look, don't believe what you see online, on TV, don't believe what you see and on the internet. It's uh, this is how it is. This is what the truth and so on. So, uh, I need to. In, what I said is that it worked in a certain extent, yes, it worked in a certain extent in the sense that uh, providing this way out uh, allowed, uh, and also that they share, they, they uh, provide this information to the uh, government. But then it was, to a certain extent, it was successful from that point of view. One of the limits for these programs, it's often, and again, it's what I saw, is the limit, it's what uh, those prisoners, once they're released, they're not well taken care of, if you want, per such, for example, problems of finding a job, for housing, and so on, that's one of the limits of those programs. So safety wise we were taken care of, but social reintegration it's the limits. You find this in Tunisia, in Morocco, a bit less in Algeria because if the strategy of the Algeria because that's bomb Algeria this uh, policy is put in place since the nineteen nineties, the early two thousand that extent they have can be able to capitalize with this kind of but still. But uh, so that's one of the things. There is cooperation with Europe. There is cooperation with Europe, exchange of information as well and uh, on this point of view. What I talked about its problem is more like migration, for example. That's what I mentioned earlier, uh, further to the question of the, uh, the person there. It's that uh, when it comes to migration here, the, the, the perceptions of Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia uh, versus uh, Europe, it's very different. Indeed, uh, the Europeans have asked uh, the three countries to establish basic hubs that would be financed by the European Union to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, migration toward Europe. As you mentioned, it's, it was negatively perceived, politically speaking, but as well by the populations as being sort of, uh, somebody put it, sort of neo-colonialism, you know, like you pay us to do the job for you. Okay? And that was one of the one of the clashes that uh, occurred. Well, Algeria out, uh, rejected this out, uh, outright. Morocco, again, I believe, eventually rejected it and so on. So as we said, that's one of the problems. There's cooperation in fighting migration between the two countries, but it's not, it's <coughs> often there's a misunderstanding of uh, the how. How and the means to put and so on. It's a lot of so uh, there's a lot of talk, a lot of discussions, agreements, but it's not well. Uh, as we say in French, I don't read it. It's not well uh, on the field. It's uh, still that it's still uh, difficult. Thank you very much. Um, balance of power in, in, in the Mediterranean. That's that's, <laughs> that's a hard one to pack into. The, Two minutes, so maybe we could we could have a side sideline conversation on that, um, and then sort of you know where, where does Turkey sort of fit in there? Um, I'll, I'll just reflect on a little a little bit of, 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 of something. Um, prior to, prior to joining Chatham House, I, I, I was I, I worked for the British Foreign Ministry for the Foreign Commonwealth Office, uh, and I used to focus on energy, and part of my portfolio was energy diplomacy, and this was we're talking about seven eight years ago. And I remember sort of working working on that on that file, um, and working quite closely with our U.S. colleagues. And at the time, some of the thinking was was around, um, you know, Israeli gas from Tamar to Leviathan to Jordan, and this was this this at the time was thought by most to be to be impossible. That 
he was thinking about rewriting, rerouting, you know, Leviathan as it comes online to export it through, you know, the Egyptian LNG infrastructure. Um, that that seems to be advancing. Uh, what, why I'm saying this is, is, is at the moment I've been I've been looking at this this piece on the energy side and in, in, in the East Med, um, where suddenly you know. That there's, there's, there's a strong political initiative that the US seems to be on board with or seems to be pushing, where you bring in Emirati and potentially Saudi investment to take out, to, ex to build an export capacity in Cyprus to export <coughs> gas from, from Israel, from Egypt, and maybe even Gaza Marine. But that, that ties in Emirati, that ties in long-term Saudi uh, funding, which, which, which will be tremendously ambitious if, if one thinks about it. If one takes energy out of the equation because the, the, uh, the natural gas market is, is, uh, is oversupplied at the moment, will be for some time, so the price points don't actually work. You can see where, the, where there's a real political play here around being driven by, by, by the US and bringing on board these Arab Gulf states to tie them in to a project where Israel is part and parcel of that center and then also tie in Egypt as well. So you can, you can bring in that piece. Um, we've seen, I mean, alluding to the balance of power, you know, we, we're seeing um, tremendous Chinese investment or quite significant investment in ports in, 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 in Lebanon. Um, we're seeing the Russians um, Picking up ports in, in Syria, we're seeing the Iranians similarly. I mean, there are so many different key players here. How, how, that, how that balances out, I, I can't sort of say or encapsulate within a few words. Like, you know, we need to sit down and map that out and, and, and see how that is. But, but certainly, um, following on from the conversation I was having at dinner last night, I mean, the Mediterranean is a, is a global space, and all the actors are lining up and stacking up. and. Uh, you know, it's 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 going to need some very careful careful management um, in a similar way to the Red Sea. But I think this this obviously there are, there are more actors, and this has a more immediate uh, and direct impact on on, uh, on on Europe. In in terms of Turkey, uh, interestingly, so this this political move that I'm describing, this sort of East Med gas move, which I don't think will materialize. Some of the calculations behind it from, from, from the Gulf Arab states is, is, is to omit Turkey from that, is to make sure that Turkey is not part of that process. Um, and I think there's... Which is a difficult proposition. You know, it's a very difficult proposition, absolutely. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that's where, you know, I, I sort of, in my, in my, in my function as a, as, as, as a consultant, um, we, you know, we look at risks, and I think it's a very risky proposition to try to, you know, to, to to not have Turkey be part and parcel of that sort of uh, energy energy equation, I think there's you know, there's too much of a risk there. But Turkey's, in terms of Turkey, Turkey's relations we've seen with, with Qatar as a, as a consequence of the blockade of, have strengthened, have deepened. Um, that's that's an important bridge for Qatar. I mean, there are there are more and more troop, uh, Turkish troops now based based there. Um, I, in, in my capacity as, you know, as, as an associate fellow at Chatham House, get invited to strategic fora, probably on a, every three or four months, that are organized by both countries, either in Doha or in Istanbul. We can see a deepening and a, and a strengthening of those relations, most certainly. Um, but, but the pushback from, from, from Saudi, I mean, you know, there's the whole Khashoggi affair, which we're not going to talk about here, but you know, there's that whole kind of game, there's that whole play there. Um, so, at, so at the moment, I think one of my, one of my colleagues at Chatham House wrote a book on, 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 on Syria, and uh, he was always very much against this idea initially, uh, you know, he's, an, he's an IR scholar, that, that Syria itself was, was, was simply a civil war. He just saw this, you know, the conflict, the war in Syria was a consequence of shifting regional uh, plates, if you like, and a shifting international order where the U.S. was beginning to create that sort of vacuum, and that's that's where we see ourselves certainly in Syria. And that's where we see ourselves in the Mediterranean. Okay. I suspect we have the end of the final hour disposal.
please uh, join me in congratulating our two speakers. session uh, which will be chaired by uh, Emiliano Cassani, Senior Officer for External Relations at the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe. Please, Emiliano, and the other speaker. So welcome uh, once again. Uh, we're up against the impossible task of keeping your attention between uh, the lunch that is coming and, and the fact that we didn't, we didn't have a coffee break. But I think it's going to be a relatively manageable task because we have a great uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, but before I get to them, uh, let me say just a couple of words about uh, NUMED. Uh, Ettore in the previous panel already uh, described uh, the initiative, so I don't need to add too much to what was already said. Uh, but I think it's important to uh, um, underline once again the role that Italy uh, played in launching this initiative within an OEC uh, context and I thank um, Ambassador, um, the Ambassador of Italy uh, to Slovenia, uh, Tricchio, here for being with us and for having this idea at the Black Strategic Forum. And I think it's also important to thank the other partners, the Compagnia di San Paolo, uh, uh, the German Marshall Fund at the beginning, and of course the Institute for International Affairs in Rome, which has been uh, developing this initiative, uh, which has had now uh, more than, I think, 20 uh, successful events over the past uh, five years of, uh, of uh, activity. Uh, New Med is much more than an academic initiative, as, as it was pointed out. It, it is a track 2, track 1.5, um, project. Um, one of the aspects that probably was not underlined enough by Ettore is that by new med we don't only mean the new Mediterranean in a global context, but we also mean the new generations uh, in the region. There is a generational aspect that I would not overemphasize. I think we are all under this international organizations in particular, under this new mantra of youth sometimes described, you know, identified in very abstract manner. But I think when it, when it comes to Southern Europe uh, and the Southern Mediterranean, there is a generational aspect that is very clear to us. And one of the initiatives we have been developing in the context of NUMAD is attracting young, up-and-coming researchers to this network. And uh, we've been quite uh, successful in doing that. There will be soon a new call uh, for selecting, it's a highly competitive process, selecting a group of researchers which will have then the opportunity to present their research uh, in Rome at the Italian Foreign Ministry. This is the third edition of, of a youth initiative we have been uh, developing for some time and Sibel, correct me if I'm mistaken, was part of that. So we are very happy today to have her in a panel. Uh, after being uh, a sort of new med uh, youth rep representative in, in recent years. Um, as Eto has said, the idea from the beginning was to look at the Mediterranean in a global context, overcoming, going beyond the view that the Mediterranean can be conceptualized and operationalized as a neighborhood, as the southern neighborhood of the European Union only. I don't think that was ever the case, even in the high days of European integration and European enlargement. It was always something more uh, than that. But it's very clear now that we have different tendencies and different actors in the Mediterranean. It's, a, it's a, in all respects a global space uh, where you have uh, local actors involved, but you also have extra-regional actors. Uh, so I'm particularly happy to have, to my right, uh, Ekaterina has been in part of this group for a while. Uh, she has been doing a lot of research on a lot of subjects, including uh, Russian foreign policy in the region. So that's also part of the effort, and that's where the OEC comes in. Many of you may be wondering why does the OEC, which is an organization based in Vienna and working on European security from the time of the Cold War and, and from the Helsinki Final Act in the 1970s, is involved in Mediterranean issues. Well, because 
we were among the very first organizations to acknowledge the interlinkage between European and Mediterranean security. There is a Mediterranean chapter in the Helsinki uh, final act, and we have been developing a Mediterranean partnership with only six countries of the South, uh, but the partnership is open, and we have been engaging other countries to track two initiatives. And, and the idea that we want to bring to uh, discussions about the Mediterranean is that uh, they have to happen in an inclusive context uh, of multipolarity or maybe lack of polarity in a context in which geopolitics is not just returning, it never really went away. It's just some of us simply forgot that geopolitics was still a factor and you know, we sort of deluded ourselves that we could institutionalize a region that is in fact very complex. I stop here, I think I said enough about Nimal, but if you're interested in knowing more or if you have ideas on how to develop this project, we are all here to listen. We are strategizing about activities for 2020. So please approach Ettore or me or others and we will be able to, uh, to initiate some, uh, some uh, fruitful discussion with all of you. Uh, I introduced the speakers. You have the biography, so I will not go in any great uh, detail. To my right, as I said, uh, Ekaterina Stefanova uh, from IMEMO in Moscow. She's completely uh, completing uh, a project on terrorism, from what I understand. But she has been following the region under different uh, aspects. Uh, to my uh, left, uh, Professor uh, Stewi, Stewi. Stewi was uh, with the University of Jordan until recently, until a few weeks ago, I understand, uh, director for the Center for Strategic Studies, uh, deep knowledge on the region under many, uh, many aspects. He has worked also with, with, with the UN and in partnership with organizations that are active uh, on, the, on the ground. And then uh, closer to my left, Sibel uh, Laban from Lebanon, uh, from the American University of, uh, of uh, Beirut. Uh, she's focusing, from what I understand, on the environmental issues, among other issues affecting the region. And as the only representative of a, a regional and international organization, I'm really here to listen to what I hope will be thought-provoking ideas on how to organize regional cooperation in the region in the years to come. So please try in your presentation to stick to the topic uh, that was identified in the agenda. It's very important for us uh, working intergovernmental organizations to get feedback on what we do or we don't do but also ideas for the future. My only observation is that it's not a great time for uh, international organizations in general, including regional organizations. We are all coping with a number of challenges. Some people predicted that the sort of end of globalism would lead to a revival of regional organizations. I'm not so sure that's the case. I think there are lots of regional trends that are important. Uh, but regional organizations are suffering together with multilateral and global organizations as a result of um, new sort of sovereignties and unilateralist or bilateralist approaches to uh, international affairs. And what I see, for instance, when it comes to my work, which is to develop the Mediterranean partnership of the OEC, is that there's a lot of interest at the technical level. Uh, you know, just to promote a little bit what we do, we bring together police officers from different countries, including your countries, uh, together with the European ones to discuss very concrete challenges, uh, trafficking of human beings, drug trafficking, trafficking of cultural property, how to cooperate in the environmental domain. Technical experts from the region want to sit down at the same table and discuss. They benefit from the exchange of information. But when it comes to the sort of high-level politics of reviving initiatives that are already there or even launching new ones, as happened in the 90s with the Barcelona process and other, I don't see a lot of appetite at the moment. I see a very difficult political dialogue, not only north-south, but also within the south <coughs> itself. So I stop here. I think Katarina can start. She has a PowerPoint presentation. No. Uh
Well, the, the reason you see this topic is because I was specifically asked to, to talk about these things by uh, Instituto Affari Internazionale. Uh, but of course, uh, we need to keep in mind the overall subject of this panel, uh, which is regional cooperation uh, and international organization. So uh, in the Mediterranean, okay, I was asked specifically to address terrorist uh, threats uh, in the MENA region in view of new security trends. So we have a s slight discrepancy here. So before I go to the subject matter, I have to make two reservations. Uh, Mediterranean versus the Middle East, broader Middle East. Uh, uh, the, the, the concept of Mediterranean is a very European concept. <laughs> okay, so for, for many of us outside the region in particular, and I, I, I guess for some inside of the region even, yeah, but for outsiders in particular, I mean, med the Mediterranean certainly exists as a, as a cultural, historical uh, space, uh, very powerful uh, image of the space and so on. But, uh, but it hardly exists as a distinct geopolitical category or as a security space, you know, as a distinct space. There's basically Europe and there is MENA you know, be it North Africa, the Levant, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and these are totally different uh, regions for us. You know, Europe is a postmodern macro region, uh, very dense with institutions, institutionally dense, you know, permeated by multilateralism inside the EU. Uh, composed primarily, not, not exclusive, but primarily by post-industrial democracies uh, uh, overpopulated by institutions, including security institutions. In contrast, the Middle East is a, is a very different type of region. It's a, a, a macro region which is far less structured, which undergoes a traumatic modernization at best. I'm, I'm trying to apply, I don't know, Petr Stomka's sort of categories, but traumatic modernization which is, like Europe, undergoing a systemic crisis, but it's a modernization crisis, it's not a postmodern crisis. Yeah? And uh, in the security area, we see uh, uh, f regional balance, disbalance. It still lives in the age of regional uh, balances, rivalries, balance of forces, disbalance of forces, uh, uh, access coalitions, uh, temporary, less temporary, you know. So uh, these are totally totally different uh, regions in, uh, uh, in that sense. Uh, so, um, uh, of the main regional trend, even if we, in the MENA, if we keep it in mind uh, recently, was of course the rise of the region, if you like. The rise of regional powers, the rise of regional dynamics, regional factors, as compared to external factors, uh, what I would call regionalization of politics and security in the Middle East. But so far, this trend has contributed more to actually further spur uh, rivalries, regional rivalries. Because the, the, the rival powers, Saudis, uh, uh, Iran in particular, have become stronger, no, not, not weaker. Yeah? But then to, uh, uh, to spur regional cooperation, co uh, collective security formats, and, uh, uh, and the like. Okay, so... Um, uh, at the moment, we are in a region, if we talk about MANA, that lacks not only regional institutions, security institutions, but even more or less structured or systematic regional dialogue on security. So, of course, that's very different from, from Europe. You know? Now, uh, a second reservation, uh, very quickly. Uh, there is a problem, of course, um, many problems in conflating uh, the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Uh, in more practical way. I mean, uh, three, three uh, conflicts, armed conflicts uh, in the Middle East are in the Mediterranean, <laughs> uh, literally in coastal, coastal countries. Two active conflicts, Libya and Syria, mm -hmm. and one uh, historical, but uh, sort of on and off, Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. But neither Iraq nor Yemen are <laughs> in the Mediterranean. So, so, so uh, what I'm pointing at is that uh, there may be really important or even key developments in the region which are not primarily in the Mediterranean, okay? 
Um, uh, and Iraq, by the way, is the worst conflict if you take the entire early 21st century. That was the worst conflict. And uh, Yemen is the worst, uh, most intense armed conflict at the moment, with worst humanitarian consequences. Even globally, it's like the worst one. And both are outside the Mediterranean. Um, uh, even in conflicts in, uh, if you ch just take Levant and North Africa, some of the key stakeholders from the Middle East are non-Mediterranean countries. Saudis, Emirates, Qatar, Iran, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, the main center of gravity of the most acute regional line of tension today, which is basically Iran versus Saudi-led coalition versus Iran, aggravated by US-Iran uh, deterioration and, and so on and so forth. The main center of gravity of that confrontation lies in the Persian Gulf. Yes, it has manifestations in the Levant too, in Syria, you, I don't even want to mention the Israeli sort of Iranian angle. It has some manifestations in other parts of Mediterranean, the recent Gibraltar uh, incident with the Iranian tanker and so on and so forth, but the main center of gravity is elsewhere. <laughs> It's not necessarily in the Mediterranean. So let's keep this in mind as we turn to, to our main subject. Now, if we, if we turn to terrorism, okay, uh, Europe and the Middle East, especially if we talk about intensity and level of terrorist threats, how much your population actually suffers directly from terrorism. Europe and the Middle East are two different regions. In fact, they are worlds apart if I may so, say so, yeah? And this, this, the contrast between the two, including across the Mediterranean, is, is part of a broader global uh, contrast that we have in the general distribution of terrorism patterns around the world. It, th there's a colossal disproportion uh, in, that, in that respect. W w and this line, line of division, if you may say, this line of division has nothing to do with the east-west controversies, nothing, nothing at all, you know. It's more north-south, but more precisely, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very stark contrast between, on the one hand, as one pole, uh, developed post-industrial world, mainly the West, but I would say the West plus, or OECD minus, minus Turkey maybe. Huh? Uh, so this world as one extreme, as one pole, and uh, parts of Muslim world, not all Muslim world, parts of Muslim worlds, uh, especially two regions, MENA and South Asia. Okay, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, what kind of contrast is that? Let's, let's have a look, that's why I bothered with the, sorry to BSF that I used the, the slides. Yeah. This is the contrast, <laughs> okay? The, fa the, the fact is highly uneven distribution of actual direct harm manifestations and harm of terrorist activity between these two regions, okay? The green line is uh, all terrorist attacks in the Middle East. We talk just about terrorist attacks. This is not combat. These are not attacks against military sec slash security targets. These are attacks against civilians and non-combatants, okay? This is the Middle East in terms of number of attacks. If you can see Europe, which is uh, EU, EU Europe, yeah? Not other uh, peripheral parts of Europe, no, but EU Europe, uh, if you can, if you notice barely that pink line somewhere at the bottom, you know, this is, this is EU Europe. If we look, these are incidents, if we look at fatalities, people who die from terrorism, the gap would be wider, <laughs> even wider. Okay, now 94% of all people who die in the world from terrorism die in three regions, mainly Middle East, broader Middle East and uh, South Asia, and, and also Africa, okay? Nine, so everyone but 6% <laughs> dies in just those three regions. Uh, okay, in particularly, um, I mean, if we look by country, you know, if you're interested, these are top 10 terrorism affected countries according to Global Terrorism Index in this century. I, I, I gave it for you in dynamics so that you can see how it changes. Now, these top 10 countries, okay, just these top 10 countries account for 90% of all terrorism activity in the world. 
no Western country among them, no OECD country among them, whatever, okay? Most people killed in the world in terrorist attacks are Muslims. <laughs> Muslims primarily die in terrorist attacks, okay? Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, by the way, that they're killed uh, uh, just in, 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 in like manner as a whole, you know, evenly distributed among the cuts. No. In each of these regions, MENA, South Asia, it's mostly areas of most intense, most heavily transnationalized uh, armed conflicts. Armed conflict areas, particularly in weak, failed states, that account for uh, almost, almost uh, three-fourths of all deaths. Okay, and mostly, most people die in the hands of just a few movements, okay? Like this top, whatever, six, okay? Account for two-fourths, uh, three-fourths, you know, 75% of all people who die in terrorism in the world, and primarily uh, in their own regions. So it's primarily people that were killed by ISIS in, in, in Syria and Iraq, you know? or at least in the Middle East, you know, not, not so much elsewhere. <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, very highly uneven distribution. Worlds apart, worlds apart. Good news is that because this view, and, and, and by the way, before, before I mention, ISIS is not necessarily always the worst of them. It's really several groups, it's not just ISIS, okay? This, even in this decade. So ISIS led by many parameters in the middle of the decade. But I mean, there were years than Boko Haram in Nigeria, radical Islamist movement, killed more people than ISIS, even in the peak of ISIS activity, okay, in terrorist attacks. Uh, Jabhat al-Nusra showed uh, there were a couple of years this decade when in, in, in Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, another jihadist group, uh, showed higher rate of attack, uh, average deaths per attack. Okay, so killed more people in one terrorist attack on average than any other group. So ISIS is certainly, it stands out because it didn't stay at regional level. It went global, declared caliphate, went global, and so on and so forth. But, but uh, otherwise, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily, for the region itself, it's not necessarily uh, the, worst, uh, the worst group. The good news is that because so much of global terrorist activity is concentrated in the hands of just these few groups, Imagine if you can pull yourself together, you as the world, international community, at any level, from local to regional, you know, and concentrate on at least one or two of these groups, on increasing pressure on just a couple of these groups, that already results in very substantial reduction in global terrorism <laughs> parameters, you know, which is what we see, you know. Okay, this recent decline that we see in global patterns of terrorism, starting from 2014, 10% reduction every year, and the same for fatalities, you know. Why it happened? Primarily because it increased international pressure on just two groups. Daesh, ISIS, yeah, to, yeah, to parallel coalitions, whatever, not, uh, not agreeing on anything among themselves, except for the need to fight Daesh, but at least on that they agreed, and this is the result. And Boko Haram in Nigeria where it was primarily a regional enterprise. Regional enterprise, okay, but th this, is, this is the result. This is the result. Now, uh, so much, for just, just to give you a, now, in contrast, this is the West, okay? What I talked about previously was where real main terrorist manifestations happen. And this is the West where we, we see, you know, uh, basically all Western countries accounting for less than, what, 4.5% of all attacks in the first 15 years of this century and uh, slightly more than 2.5% of uh, deaths. Okay, so the contrast is really... Uh, generally, OECD countries in this decade, like le recent years, several years, account for, accounted all OECD countries, accounted for no more than 1% of deaths, okay, from terrorism in the world, one, one percent, you know. Now, um, this divide, if we just can come back to where we started, strikes right across the Mediterranean, which is probably why we need to talk about it. 
So yes, these are two radically different patterns as, as regional patterns, but it strikes right across the Mediterranean. So basically, this is a cross-regional space where this contrast, uh, contrast is felt most intensively because this is the closest where the two regions meet, you know, uh, which is probably why we, we, pay, we, uh, we pay attention to it. And now, um, uh, to complicate matters further, and that's my final point before I turn to anti-terrorist cooperation as such, and I'll have uh, four quick points on that. Uh, to complicate matters further, uh, read, uh, terrorism in regions, uh, regions that are most, uh, most uh, heavily affected by terrorism directly are not necessarily the same regions where terrorism uh, generates the largest international hype. Yeah, if you, if you get what I mean. Yeah? So uh, the ability of terrorism to affect international politics and security, okay, to affect global media, you know, to shape global anti-terrorist agenda, unfortunately is heavily dependent on how central a certain regional context is to global politics. The West is far more central to global politics than any part of the Middle East. So as a, as a result, any more or less deadly, I'm sorry for being politically incorrect, more or less deadly terrorist attack somewhere in London, Brussels, Nice, Paris, whatever, you know, Lyon, uh, raises incomparably larger <laughs> hype, you know, grasps the attention of, much more attention of international media, you know, uh, and, and, and has a larger effect than uh, far more frequent and far more deadly uh, far more regular attacks anywhere in, I don't know, Baghdad, uh, Homs, uh, Bamako, Mali, you know, Mogadishu, Kabul, Kabul we, can, we can go on and on. You know, and this, colossal, this is a reverse disproportion. Like you have an asymmetry in distribution of actual terrorist manifestations, but you have a reverse asymmetry in how much they matter for global anti-terrorist agenda. Uh, and, and this will stay. I mean, ISIS or no ISIS, even after the demise of physical core of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, this colossal disproportion is not going anywhere. So we, in the coming years, we'll still face a situation where the bulk of actual manifestations of terrorism and direct harm from terrorism will affect civilian population in Muslim world, particularly in areas of major armed conflicts of the type that I described, while the largest, uh, well, relatively few manifestations of terrorism in the developed world, including Europe, will continue to raise, the, uh, attract disproportionate attention, but more importantly, will continue to disproportionately affect global anti-terrorist agenda. To give you an example, some of the issues were really more specific to a post-industrial society, you know, mostly Western society, yeah, but others as well, but developed, developed society. Uh, know, radicalization of the second generation Migrants, mostly Muslim migrants, something that people mentioned already, or uh, this phenomena of lone jihadist uh, or micro cells, uh, homegrown uh, micro cells uh, inspired by jihadist ideology, or the rise of far right, right wing extremism increasingly directed against migrants, uh, especially Muslims. Well, of course, these are important problems. But, but gosh, I mean, <laughs> they are very important for you. <laughs> it doesn't mean, uh, they disproportionately, they're overrepresented in the international uh, anti-terrorist agenda, really. I mean, if, uh, I, I can give a number of examples. You and Ted sends a question of the main uh, issues, most pressing issues they identify are, those, are these issues. But they are not necessarily a priority or hardly even relevant, <laughs> some of them. For those st states and societies that actually suffer <laughs> far greater direct burden of uh, harm from terrorist attacks, in their case, aggravated by multiple consequences of ongoing armed conflicts. Okay? So, important uh, thing to note for any anti-terrorist cooperation is that, especially if it's cross-regional, as we see in the Mediterranean, is 
you need to bridge this gap somehow. You, uh, well, probably impossible to bridge it, but you need to, to narrow it down. There are several ways this could be done. I'll just mention them. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna uh, be specific about it. If there are questions, we, uh, we can discuss it afterwards. But basically, some ways to do it. Uh, one way is to, you should prioritize, uh, I mean, uh, conflict resolution. <laughs> You should, prior, as a long-term anti-terrorist strategy, that is equally important for these regions and, and uh, has, has implications for you as well. The main focus should be on addressing the type of conflict that breeds the bulk of global terrorism, especially in the MENA, at least for such conflict currently in the MENA. Yeah? Uh, so not, not some peripheral Islamist separatist conflicts in functional states. This thing is manageable. It's not doesn't produce the bulk of global terrorism, but conflicts, transnationalized civil wars, regionalized civil wars, in uh, in weak or failed states. You know, so one point. Another point is uh, prioritize issues. If we come more narrowly to anti-terrorist agenda, prioritize issues that are equally important for your developed world and for your counterparts across the the sea. And there are some such issues which are re really e of equal importance. Uh, our colleagues have, referred to, have um, referred to some of them. So foreign terrorist fighters. I mean, our three regions, your region, his region, <laughs> and my region, my home region, post-Soviet Eurasia. We are the three country, main countries of origin <laughs> of foreign fighters who went to fight in Syria and Iraq. Uh, many of our foreign fighters will not end up in their countries of origin. They are stuck in third countries. They're somewhere in transit. It's a circulation. It's really a cross-regional issue. It's a regional issue, cross-regional issue, national issue. So concentrate on those things, okay? Another point, uh, avoid blurring the notion of terrorism. Who is a terrorist actor to the point where, which makes it meaningless? I'm uh, specific, uh, uh, in context unrelated to terrorism, you know, like U.S.-Iranian confrontation. They hate each other, fine. But uh, U.S. decides to declare uh, Corps of Islamic Guard uh, as, as a terrorist organization. Well, that opens a Pandora box, you know. Now every second uh, Islamist in the region, I mean, Pentagon could be, CIA, MI5, you know, GRU, whatever. Uh, we, are, we are blurring the category beyond any sense, you know, we should avoid that. Uh, Anti-terrorist cooperation, because specifically, sorry for taking one minute more, but uh, since Emilio you asked specifically about like uh, anti-terrorist cooperation in a more narrow sense, yeah? Technical cooperation, what we call technical. Se technical security assistance programs, okay? Either specifically anti-terrorist or tailored to anti-terrorist needs, which could, or that could have implications for anti-terrorist needs. Some of this is actually going on very actively across the Mediterranean, you know, uh, both at the EU level, uh, but uh, the, the dominant type is, of course, bilateral uh, uh, assistance programs, usually between uh, European powers and their former colonies, but not only, you know, could be, could be different. Uh, now, these uh, programs are not useless. They can really make a difference, but <laughs> primarily in relation to countries which, are, which retain functionality. Okay, Tunisia, Morocco was mentioned. Uh, countries which are not areas of protracted armed conflicts. Okay, but, but they cannot fill the void for conflict-torn countries in weak or failed states such as Libya. It's just, they don't make any difference, frankly, you know, unless you first manage the, the basic thing. And I just want to mention for our uh, European colleagues, uh, particularly from EU and uh, or elsewhere, that uh, your co technical cooperation on anti-terrorism with Sahel countries, which is sank the, the uh, du, du Sahel, yeah, the West Africa, is no less important. <laughs> it's really no less important because this, this is an emerging sort of region and, that, and, and they, unlike you know, other parts of the world, uh, well, unlike Middle East, they were able to organize, there's a subgroup and so on. So, but please note that these are very important uh, too. <laughs> they Thank should, you. I, I have to stop. Uh, there was no time to mention uh, how this affects uh, the rationale that that gives for 
increased uh, or stepped up or uh, regional dialogue on security with a prospect of ultimately establishing some more institutional mechanism. I have to stop here, sorry. Thank you. And a, a, a good example for you, Middle East, people, people from the Middle East, is of course uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. This is what a region can do in anti-terrorism if it's an organized region. If it's national authorities, all neighbors, and African Union working together. Crack down on Boko Haram. The same combination doesn't work for Somalia because national, functional national authorities component is missing. Yeah? I have to stop here, sorry. Thank you again for uh, the long, <laughs> long but also fascinating and thought-provoking uh, presentation which revisited also a bit the notion of what the region really is and, and the Mediterranean. We were having a discussion last night very informally or this morning, I don't remember, about the very notion of Mediterranean, whether, you know, of course there is a history to that notion, there's a reality of a sea. But we were discussing to what extent, especially in the EU, in Europe, we have been using this Mediterranean paradigm also as a sort of alibi, you know, not, not to uh, be too, um, clear about some of the conflicts, not to be too direct, not to be, and, and, and in your presentation, I mean, you questioned some of the, you know, the, some of the validity of, of the notion of, of a Mediterranean region when it comes to specific phenomenon as terrorism. But a question that I have for you, which you can answer in the Q&A later, is precisely about the numbers you gave, because, you know, if you can't gauge the phenomenon of terrorism by looking only at numbers of casualties, and you, you yourself said that you know, the terrorist attacks have gr seem to have greater impact and greater consequences in the West, even if numbers are lower. And I think you know, one of the aims of terrorist groups is, is precisely to create fear and to spread fear and to leverage it politically. So maybe the two regions, you know, there's a sort of rebalancing of sorts because we, have, we are less affected, but we are more deeply affected maybe So um, at the same time. But let's move on with the program. Uh, Sibel, how does the region yeah. look from your standpoint? Please, okay. you have 15 minutes. Thank you. That's generous. OK, so hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today and an honor. So uh, uh, my topic is a bit different. Uh, I'm going to take you on a short journey to explore food and the environment, because this is my area of expertise, of course, keeping it, uh, keeping it under the umbrella of today's conference. So my topic is about shifting to healthier diets for environmental sustainability from a food system approach. First, I'm going to go briefly o uh, over the most challenging global um, issues about health and environment, how we can address those from a food system approach, how Yes. Oh, and okay. Is this better? Okay. How sustainable diets advance the SDGs? What's the relationship between environmental sustainability and food consumption patterns in the MENA region? And finally, the role of regional cooperation. Malnutrition in all its forms continues to be one of the greatest challenges faced by our generation. While undernutrition persists in, sorry, persists in many countries, and over 800 million people are going hungry. At the same time, we are witnessing an escalating rise in obesity and diet-related chronic diseases, such as diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, across all age groups, without any exception, especially in low- and middle-income countries. From an environmental perspective, we have definitely exploited our planet at an unprecedented rate. In fact, high-input resource-intensive farming systems have not only produced have not only increased food production, but also at a high cost to the environment, generating soil depletion, water scarcity, deforestation, and high levels of greenhouse gas emission. Is the situation any different in the MENA? Well, not really, but it's definitely aggravated by several factors. First and foremost, of course, you all know, uh, it's, a it's a region of turmoil. There's conflict, constant political unrest, and social distress. The region is highly dependent on food imports. We are the largest net importer of cereals, poultry, and, um, and sugar. And uh, we are exposed to high food prices. There's a high to alarming level of food insecurity, poverty in several countries, instability, and weak policy response with 
little or no regional coordination. So how do we address these global health and environmental challenges? One promising and effective way is that we need to transform our food systems to address these challenges. We need to start having this mindset of how are we going to feed a, a growing and urbanizing population without further depleting our limited natural resources? And this would provide an opportunity not only to provide healthy diets for optimal health, but also to address issues of inequity and inequality and putting a halt to the degradation of our natural resources. How do we do that? How uh, do we transform our food systems? There are many ways because the food system is like has several drivers, but one effective way is by shifting our food consumption patterns and starting adopting sustainable diets. Those diets that have been proven to have low environmental impact, so they address climate change and protect the environment. They are healthy, so they mitigate food and nutrition insecurity on the long run. And most importantly, they advance commitments to the SDGs, particularly SDGs 2, 3, and 12. Now you may be wondering, how do we adopt a sustainable diet? What's the practical approach? Very easy. One way to do it, and one very simple way, is by lowering your intake of red meat, because red meat has been proven to have higher environmental impact. To produce one kilogram of red meat, you need 15,000 liters of water. And we also recommend consuming this in small amounts because it could be harmful to the health. At the same time, at the bottom of the pyramid, you can see that you can increase your intake of plant-based food items, such as legumes, cereals, vegetables, and fruits, which we usually recommend to be eaten in higher quantities due to their health benefits, but also because they have been proven to have a very low environmental impact. Now that I showed you that sustainable diets help advance the SDGs, I also want to stress that the sustainability of food systems is all help also advance the SDGs. Why is that? Because food is a common thread that links all the SDGs, given the interconnectedness between between the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of the food system. As you can see here, each of these dimensions is addressing a certain global challenge, topic, or trend, and hence influence a set of specific SDGs. So if these dimensions are interrelated, having the core as a sustainable food systems, then they would be addressing a multitude, almost all SDGs. So now we know that food is the single strongest lever uh, for optimal health and environmental sustainability on Earth. But what are we doing about this fact? How are we tackling it? On a global level, we have the Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems. They have released a report last December. And uh, this is a large consortium, by the way, of experts from all around the world. They have highlighted the two ends for the food system to achieve their main concern. So their main concern is how are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050 through a healthy and sustainable diet while not exceeding the planetary boundaries and not putting demands on our resources. They have set two targets and five strategies to achieve change and advance towards the SDGs. What about the MENA region? How are we addressing this issue? Well, we know for sure that our, cons our current food consumption patterns are very unhealthy. All the populations in the region have overconsume harmful foods, especially animal-based foods and fatty foods and sugar-sweetened beverages, while at the same time they underconsume below recommended level the protective foods, which are basically plant-based foods and fish. And this have increased the prevalence of chronic diseases. So, we took this observation, we published our first study, the first in the region, where we wanted to see what happens if we shifted our food consumption patterns from unhealthy to healthy. How would this affect the environment? Is it in a positive or a negative way? We, across 22 Middle Eastern countries, we studied the environmental footprints, which are water and energy use and greenhouse gas emission of four food groups associated with health diseases. Why four? Just for convenience, since this was our first study. We took red meat, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, and fruits. What we found is that if we reduced our consumption of red meat, we would be saving on all these footprints. 
While on the other hand, if we increased our consumption of these foods, although they're healthy, we would be using more of these environment, of these resources. One point I want to make here is that this is not a bad result, but we should not think that we should avoid red meat and completely replace it with vegetables and beans. I mean, substituting vegetable protein with animal protein because this would put pressure on our resources. So always keep in mind that moderation is key. Our second study, we also took the case of Lebanon, but here we analyzed our current food consumption patterns and how they are performing towards the environment. Are they having a positive or a negative effect? In Lebanon, we have two major dietary patterns. We have the traditional Lebanese, which is very similar to the Mediterranean diet, and we have the Western pattern, which is high in red meat, poultry, fast food, and uh, sweets. We used the same metrics, and we found that the traditional Lebanese had an overall lower environmental footprint compared to the Western diet. What are these trends and data telling us? That the future of food depends on our food system and that business as usual is no longer an option if we want to move forward towards the SDGs and achieve the targets. What do we need? We actually need effective governance of food systems, governance that go beyond uh, national boundaries, that spans level from local to global and that encompasses formal and informal organizations. All of these elements are very necessary to take effective action. And here comes the major role of uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, to the discourse on the future of food. They had an international symposium on the 10th and 11th of June this year, where they discussed uh, alternative pathways to sustainability of the food systems in the area of food and agriculture. And among these alternative pathways, they highlighted five measures that our future food systems could adopt to provide healthy and sustainable diets for all. First, countries should set in place public policies and laws with proper incentives that help protect healthy diets. Meaning, for example, they could tax unhealthy food, they could restrict food advertising for children, they could even enforce um, easier to understand comprehensive labels for convenience to the consumer. Second, governments are accountable to improve access to and promotion of local and fresh food. International trade agreements need to positively influence food systems. For example, we can have restrictions on ultra-processed food or what is known as junk food. As you may know, these foods tend to fare better in international trade, so we want to make sure that trade enables way to bring healthy food to the table, not only safe food, which is generally unhealthy. System approach. In order to transform our food system, we need to look at a system approach, addressing every area or discipline that has to do with food, starting with healthy soil seeds and sustainable agricultural practices. And finally, the role of academia was lauded, given the importance of research in advancing the, res the, importance of research in advancing the work on food systems and helping governments to introduce policy reforms. And with respect to my last point, this is exactly what my organization, the American University of Beirut and FAO, has done. They have signed a partnership agreement in support of research for sustainability of the water energy food health system. So in simple terms, what they're gonna do, they're gonna collaborate on research programs and activities across several disciplines from water scarcity and management, agricultural production, nutrition, the environment, and also uh, promote policy dialogue and enhance information and knowledge exchange along these topics. One last point I wanna make regarding speaking of regional cooperation is the study that Lebanon and Tunisia are currently undertaking uh, towards the enhancement of the Mediterranean diet in the region. This is a big project funded by the government of Italy through the Ministry of Health under the guidance of FAO. Both countries here, uh, the objective of the study is that both countries are trying to generate evidence on whether and how the Lebanese and Tunisian dietary patterns have moved away from the traditional Mediterranean diet and try to develop policies and interventions that guarantee a healthy diet for all. Finally, my key message is malnutrition is still persisting. 
our environments are not sustainable. Food system is the right approach to tackle these by providing healthy and quality food while preserving the environment. Shifting to sustainable diets is key. Regional cooperation is crucial. And addressing food consumption is integral to achieve health, environmental sustainability, food security, and SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. A lot, Sibel, for, for sharing your perspective. And for, for those of you who might be skeptical about the geopolitical relevance of, of the subject that Sibel uh, brought to the fore, I mean, the, uh, if my figures are correct, more than the, the MENA region imports more than 50% of its food. 80%. Lot of, exactly. Uh, 80%. It's, it's in many ways counterintuitive, but it's a highly dependent uh, region. The providers are often uh, extra regional. A lot of it comes from uh, the US, Brazil, even India. So even in that respect, it's a global context that defines uh, the region. And you know, for all the good things about the Mediterranean diet that in Italy and in other countries uh, we promote, uh, in obesity rates in the region are going up and they're very high even in very poor context. There is actually a correlation between the two uh, phenomena. Not to speak of the role that some of these issues have in creating conflict. You know, the conflict that you said, you suggested, is the root cause of, you know, one of the causes of terrorism. But conflict is not only about land or about uh, political and economic differences. Sometimes it's also about livelihood. It's about uh, a shrinking space for agriculture in the region for pro productive activities. All due of to these are drivers to put security due to climate systems. change and environmental degradation. So I think you know it's. I think the inclusion of this topic was a was a good one. It's not a marginal or or a postmodern topic. I think. You know, what we would like to see is also environmental movements in the region, which, you know, are uh, considerably less developed than in Western Europe or in, or in um, richer, richer countries. But let's continue with the program. Uh, professor, you have the floor. I think I will give you also 15 uh, minutes. Let's also keep in mind that we are being listened by people very diligently and patiently, and they may want to intervene before the lunch. So let's try to give them at least 20 minutes to ask questions. Please. Thank you very much. And uh, also, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is my first uh, time to this uh, forum. And thank you very much for uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I can see looking at the faces of the audience, I mean, they're really struggling to stay awake before I speak, so I mean, there's a challenge now to keep them, you know, uh, awake, you know, after I speak, because uh, you know, I think uh, we're all of us suffering from uh, defici coffee deficiency at this, uh, this moment. Uh, I was asked to uh, speak about the challenges uh, facing the region and, you know, look at ways of cooperation. It's difficult to look at uh, how uh, can countries, international organizations cooperate without uh, looking at what are issues that need to be you know, worked on and cooperated uh, you know, about. Um, I want to speak when, in the context of you know, this morning session also, that we are really in the region where we're going through a very uh, uh, historical, uh, dramatic uh, uh, changes in, 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 in the last uh, seven, eight years. Uh, the, the entire, you know, regional order has almost, that we knew before, has almost collapsed. And now there is a new regional order in the making. And, you know, there is, within, in this context, there is, you know, regional struggle, as was mentioned, you know, by, I think, Katrina and uh, also Neil. Uh, regional countries are competing to shape uh, the region, but also international uh, countries also, as the United States and Europe and China and Russia are also involved in that particular uh, struggle in reshaping the, uh, the, the regional uh, uh, dynamics and order and uh, drawing the lines between different interests. In this context, you know, I can, I can, I can say that the international order is uh, taking a back seat, actually, in, 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 in the Middle East right now. Uh, UN role is declining, uh, you know, because of the unilateral, uh, sometimes, you know, more than and multilateral and you know, cooperation between different countries. You know, I think um, 
I don't want to say that there are no rules at all, but I want, I want to say that countries are behaving yani, without necessarily uh, respecting or, or going back to the uh, international uh, laws and regulations, the new and uh, regulations that uh, govern, govern them. And that, in this context, we have an open conflict. You know, I must say that we have, you know, we have the uh, Syrian conflict still you know, ongoing. You know, it's been going for seven, seven years. The Arab-Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, Israeli conflict is also open, and you know, there is escalation, you know, uh, every once in a while, and the problem is unresolved. The, the Yemeni uh, problem is ongoing. In Yemen also, uh, I'm sorry, Libya also, conflict is ongoing. So in, in this context, I think it's very difficult to speak about normal issues, normal, normal problems that you're having. We have a struggle, actually, in reshaping the nature of the state. You know, and, uh, you know, maybe this will be my starting point about the challenges. You know, uh, uh, there is more attention paid in, internationally in Europe, probably, to the uh, violent uh, extremism that, you know, we see in the region, terrorism and, and what have you. But what is really under, going on in the region, there is also growth of, I call it, uh, nonviolent extremism or soft extremism, if you want, you know, uh, uh, with divergent views in the region, with a very deep struggle uh, on about the nature of the state that they want, you know, drama. Uh, uh, for instance, we cannot ignore the, the the struggle between political Islamic movements in general. Not not talking about the extremist groups, and you know the secular, if you want, groups, whatever any name you can give to the non any political Islamic uh, groups. Uh, about the nature of the state that's taking place in, in everywhere. That's taking place in, in Iraq, in Syria, maybe also, and uh, still Egypt, you know, Libya, Jordan, even so, uh, you know, different uh, different countries. There is the last ten years we have seen the rise of political Islamic movements of all sorts. They're not the same, but they have different groups. But then, nevertheless, the project is that there is you know some uh, issue with the notion of the nation state that we know it. And you know that's that's really creating a lot of uh, 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 problems, you know, for within countries, not only across uh, countries, uh, within within countries as as well, and that's shaping a lot of the you know, behavior of states and different groups and and and, and there. So a major challenge for us is really that particular struggle that is fueled by you know. Uh, uh, you know, these, uh, these issues. The other uh, point I want to mention, which has been ignored in the discussion, which has a lot of implications, which is also the refugee, refu forced, uh, re yani refugee issue. It's a very important issue. Now, of course, the entire world was very uh, concerned about this a few years ago, but today we hardly see the uh, refugee situation in the region, even in the news, you know, in, in, in the news. Of course, you know, the, the, the moment during the, the intense, intense conflict in Syria and other countries with the, with, the, with the huge influx of the Syrians, there was a lot of attention to that in the media, but also from a humanitarian perspective. But now we can see that there's a decline in the, in the, in the, uh, 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 um, uh, in the support, international support to refugees. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, almost you know, countries are told you know, do it your own way. I mean, it will help you a little bit, but you know, it's your own problem. You know, it, to some extent, and we can see the backlash of this, you know, uh, lack of solution for the refugees in Lebanon, for instance, and in Turkey, in Jordan maybe less, but at least for the Syrian refugees in Turkey and Lebanon, we can see the potential clashes that you know are taking place and 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 the response to this. So this is this is a major issue, uh, not only about the Syrian, Syrian refugees, but now we can imagine, you know, uh, refugees from Yemen, from Libya, North Africa, and, you know, other, and other countries. It's a major issue of the displacement, development, destruction of people's homes, and, you know, uprooting. And, of course, Europe is very much affected by this, whether it's through the illegal migration or through the illegal migration from the southern Mediterranean. So this is a very key, you know, problem, I think, for for both uh, parts of the of the of the of the, of the other region, uh, I would I don't want also to exclude uh, the economic situation from the challenges, especially if we're talking about youth. And in, in, in <coughs> now the uh, the major one of the major problems, of course, you know we can see that because of the conflict, there's disruption of the economy and sluggish economic 
outlook for the region, all of that, and cost of living is rising and so on. But I think of particular importance is the, the high level of unemployment. Unemployment in the region reaches between 20 to 30 percent. When we take it to the youth, you know, when we look at the youth uh, uh, alone, we're talking about sometimes 40 percent among unemployment rate among youth, sometimes even higher than this. And, you know, this is really with the, with the fact that, you know, that the population is young and going to be young for some time, you know, this is a bombshell. You know, that's a bombshell that can lead you to everything, you know, including extremism and, uh, and so on. And there is absolutely no, 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 at least from uh, the assessment of what's going on in the region, there is really no uh, end of the tunnel, uh, uh, no light at the end of the tunnel, you know, for this particular problem. And you, we can see last two weeks ago we released uh, some of the results of the Arab barometer, you know, uh, in Jordan, uh, and as well as also other uh, surveys in about Arab countries, the, 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 the intent to uh, migrate, you know, among, you know, Arab, Arab countries is amazing. I mean, there are four countries that, you know, the, the, those who uh, said that they like to, uh, to migrate are between 45 and maybe 50 percent. But also the others, you know, 30 percent, 35 percent. When you look at the youth, it's even more, more higher. And Europe is a, a preferred destination, you know, for, uh, for this, which is really an indication that people are looking for another place to continue their lives, you know, aspiration in their families and to achieve, you know, at least to get a job, get a good education. The driver for this is economic reason, mainly economic reason. So I think the economy, you know, is, which is definitely part of it is a result of the conflicts, but also part of it of the, 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 the nature of the economic system, going back to Neil's approach, you know, the model, you know, that was uh, in, in place before for economic development, which, you know, I totally agree with Ekaterina that we have very, I mean, a clear failure of the modernization and the process in, in, in the region. Uh, look at also another issue which is very, uh, very important. Uh, now with displacement and refugees, the, the level of literacy, you know, is increasing in, in the region. In some countries, you know, it's already high, Morocco, Egypt, and, you know, Sudan and, and other countries. But with, 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 with the refugee influx and, you know, all of this, it is increasing, but also, Yani, uh, um, although yani, there are some yani, good indicators you know, for education and the higher level of education, the major problem now with education in the region is quality, quality of education. People go to, uh, to universities, they get degrees, but they hardly can actually uh, find employment with them. They don't have skills. You know, the quality of education is very, is very, uh, very problematic. And, and th therefore, you know, I think, uh, I, I think uh, we have a, a major problem in, uh, in, in our countries, including especially if you look at the, what's going on at the fourth industrial revolution, you know, and, and the, 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 the dramatic changes that are taking place in industry and education and stuff like that. I think, you know, this is a major uh, challenge for, uh, uh, for, for us. Now, um, I want to say one more, to mention one more, uh, Problem, maybe. Um, how much am, am I doing time? One more minute. No, one one more minute. Okay, that will have uh, yeah, one, one point, and then maybe another uh, final comment about cooperation. Now, drugs, by the way, is becoming a major problem in in, in, in the region. Drug addiction, in, in, which is was hardly uh, yeah, unheard of. I think it got really took off, uh, uh, became, uh, 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 the phenomena became very large uh, after the Arab Spring, the, the numbers. And, you know, I, I must say that the war itself, the conflict and the extremism, all of this was also, you know, a, 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 a prime uh, situation for, you know, illegal, you know, drugs for gangs and for organized crime and, and so on. There's the drugs now in the region you know, it's really, really a major problem. I cannot emphasize how much it is, it is a problem. It's largely spreading. Drugs are manufactured in the region. They are smuggled in the, within the region, and it's always very cheap, uh, um, economic, uh, economically speaking. And, you know, also uh, now it's a problem. All of this, again, you know, is, is a recipe for all kinds of problems you want, extremism or whatever you want to say. Maybe one point or two about uh, cooperation. 
uh, and the role of international. Uh, you know, again, I, I'm definitely pro yani, bringing back the international organizations into the scene. But in the UN, where is the UN? I don't know. The Arab League is disappearing. Almost. The, the UN is almost, yani, it's formally there, but it has no, uh, no impact. And let's be honest, you know, when we say the international community, when we say Europe, uh, Europe is not one thing. The international community is not one thing. There is a lot of competition in between. But also, there is interest that sometimes, most of the time, governs what countries do in, in, in this regard. And uh, so I, I think now what we're seeing, you know, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's very difficult to talk about uh, fighting for certain, of course we do, but you know, like, Allying the countries in according uh, to maybe certain principles or certain uh, ideas, human rights or what have you. Countries now are looking for their own, or their own interest, and you know, prime example is what's happening between the relationship between Gulf countries and Europe, you know, and and, 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 and the United States and other and other countries. Where because of the economic relations, economic interests, you know, some a lot of issues are over to some extent. Look, so what we're seeing now is. Is really a, a, a big struggle, you know, that has regional, uh, of course, dimension and has also uh, um, international dimension. I think without beginning to tackle these major conflicts in the region, you know, I think that's where, where the international community, I think, owes it to the to the yeah, to the Middle East and to the, to their own people, beginning to tackle these major issues. You know, I, I think you know uh, if we don't do that. Uh, if we cannot uh, yeah, uh, achieve something like uh, resolution to the Palestinian Israeli conflict, you know, the Iraqi situation, the Syrian conflict, you know, almost the conflict is over, but there's a lot of destruction, you know, and there's no reconstruction effort, and there's no peace in, in, this, in this situation. If we don't you know, begin to tackle the macro level issues, I think we will see a you know, continuation of a region full of problems with extremism, with unemployment, with our drugs with our, uh, whatever migration you want uh, to say. So with that, I end, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor, for the, the wide-ranging presentation, for bringing up once again the issue of migration and reminding us that it's not a north-south uh, phenomenon only. In fact, you know, uh, mass displacement <laughs> and, and uh, large-scale movements are uh, affecting the region meaning, you know, the MENA region much more than they are affecting Europe. But once again, I think in terms of analysis, we can apply some of the findings that the Katerina applied to terrorism. The numbers are much lower, but they are affecting, you know, they are attracting much more attention and affecting our societies uh, more deeply, at least, and um, that's the, uh, the perception. And also, thank you for making these final points about regionalism and and, you know, again, it's a very complicated topic, a very complex topic. The way I look at it is that regional organization cannot substitute for uh, states, and especially they cannot just be created or overimposed on realities that are not ready uh, for regional cooperation. So it, it has to be the actors in the region and uh, to call for uh, regional solutions. And at the moment, there is... Uh, a sort of zero-sum uh, view of the region and, and everyone just trying to uh, score points against each other. At the same time, I think there is a deeper problem in the region, which has to do with the fact that states have become very assertive, sometimes also very belligerent in their approach, but they are also weak in other uh, respects. Uh, so for a long time, there was this narrative of a fragmentation of the region, of implosion, uh, because of non-state actors, because of movements. That's one part of the story, but the other part of the story is that these states, you know, most of them, not all of them, but most of them are still there, and they have uh, very sometimes aggressive foreign policies. And that's, I think, also a major difference among many others between Europe uh, during the Cold War and the Middle East today, when debates are are uh, head on, on a possible applicability of the OECE, CSCE, OECE experience uh, to the Middle East, I always urge you know, some uh, caution because you know, Cold War Europe uh, had a lot of transnational phenomenon, but states were overall quite strong and quite established, and, and so they could at least negotiate you know, among each other and, 
and come to intergovernmental solutions that add some credibility to be implemented. Whereas in the region, you have non-state actors that play a very important role, and you have states that are on very bad terms with each other, but they are weak internally, and maybe because of that, they become aggressive externally. So that's one difference among many others. But uh, there are still good reasons to look into the experiences of Europe, including the OEC, and see what can be uh, you know, maybe readapted you know, and, and recycled in a way in other regional contexts. But we're not here to sort of export an OEC model that is having challenges even in Europe. With that, I open the floor uh, to uh, questions. I see a hand over there. I don't know if the microphone is going around. And then two more <coughs> people here. Yeah, let's start with the lady. If you can please identify yourself. Yes. Uh, lady in the back. Working, yeah. My name is uh, Saskia Harkema. I'm from the Netherlands, professor and uh, human rights activist. I have a question for Dr. Stepanova. Uh, you clearly described, let's say, the divide in the world on the basis of or between Europe and the MENA region uh, at a an systemic and institutional level. And I raised the question whether this could somehow also be a barrier to collaboration uh, in the Mediterranean. I have a question for you. Uh, and you also clearly described, let's say, the, uh, the discrepancy between the effect and impact of terrorism in these different regions, whereby it's very clear that the Middle East and the MENA region is suffering at a far larger extent. Um, I don't know if you have heard, but you must have heard about false flag operations. These are covered operations initiated by the governments to destabilize a region. And uh, to what extent uh, do you think that these false flag operations are in actual fact the reason of this discrepancy between Europe and the MENA? And is this not part of also uh, what is happening in the region? I saw a couple of hands here to my right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anna Koreneva, and I represent the student organization Model United Nations Prague. My question is primarily addressed to Ms. Stepanova. Uh, you mentioned uh, cooperation as a tool to combat terrorism. And my question is, um, taking into account that um, MENA region is a sophisticated note of interests of stakeholders who are obviously pursuing their own interest, how do you think possibly they can cooperate? What are effective ways of cooperation uh, so that this combat against such, um, uh, such issues as terrorism can be uh, combated in a more effective way? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Elena Kalugina and Professor Trevoril and a uh, healthy food fan. And uh, so my question <laughs> is to Sibel. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for raising up such an important topic because also in mass media we can see a lot of uh, news about uh, how many people die uh, during the teract uh, in such a country, but nobody talks about how many people die every second from diabetes, from cancer, and... Um, from uh, heart uh, diseases. Um, very interesting presentation, but I've seen some um, contradictions. And uh, uh, traveling around the world, I've noticed <coughs> one thing, the cheap food is not healthy food. And healthy food cost. Uh, yes, it's uh, very good that you want to give the food to all the people on the earth. But how to do it? Everybody want to eat uh, clean veg vegetables, uh, uh, full grain bread, and olive oil. Um, but uh, in some countries, it's uh, easier to, it's cheaper to, to buy two sandwiches or two hamburgers and one bottle of Coca Cola instead of one yogurt. The question is to you, as the scientist, as a, and as a person, do you believe that it's possible to uh, convince? to convince people not to eat uh, meat 
if yes, how many years do we need to, <laughs> to make this shift? Only uh, 12 minutes. Are there any more questions? If there are not, I will just ask the speakers in reverse order to respond to some of the questions that were asked, and then we close it. So no more questions. So Professor, maybe you can start responding. Just pick any question. No, non, no question was uh, direct, yes. directed to you specifically, but feel free to maybe make your closing observations. Okay. You know, in, uh, Europe and, and, the, and, and of course the MENA, you know, have a lot of, uh, I mean, we're not talking about the history, but also the challenges, you know, are very similar. I think, in my opinion, you know, I, I discussed this with uh, our, some European ambassadors in Jordan, even, you know, the representative of the EU, that maybe, 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 I'm not uh, I'm saying definitely, there might be a need for, uh, uh, changing the approach uh, to uh, helping and solving the problems in the region. Maybe, maybe we need a paradigm shift in thinking about how to yeah, maybe uh, start tackling these issues. Of course, all, you know, the security uh, cooperation and all the immediate, you know, the things that cannot wait, you know, the, the frames are there. But I'm talking about if we want to think about the, the take the global nature of the problems in the region that, as we mentioned, you know, uh, today in different uh, context. I think, I think there might be, at least it's worthwhile the exercise of thinking, can we continue the same way that we are you know, doing and uh, in, in, in helping these countries and cooperating? Or maybe we need, you know, some sort of a paradigm shift you know, that we all discuss and, and come up with maybe new ideas. I think it's worthwhile to think this. I mean, I cannot emphasize the importance of EU to the region. I mean, this is because of the history, because of the nature of the system, the everything, and a lot can be, you know, benefit, you know, can, uh, the EU can benefit a great deal uh, from the cooperation, but also we benefit uh, more you know, from this. Uh, but I think we need, maybe need to uh, reduce some, you know, to rethink some of the issues. The final point I want to say about you know, extremism and, you know, uh, of course, you know, more people are killed in, in, in the region, but this is part of a larger struggle, too, because I mentioned it. the struggle is not, when you go to terrorism in Europe, it's not, you know, it's against, you know, of course, the, the objectives are clear, but it, when you talk about extremism and terrorism in the region, it's part of an ongoing conflict. So the size is not the problem here. I mean, I think, you know, I think we should focus on other things as well. Again, in our region, the struggle is, you know, for the nature of the state, you know, and I think in that in that sense, you know, I can I can see that, that the you know, uh, uh, the, you, the international community should look more into you know, just the immediate uh, 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 the, uh, uh, dimension of extremism, and we can also point out, you know, without accusing anybody in particular, that also as the professor from the Netherlands also you know, made a point that extremism was used, manufactured, and politically used in certain areas without mentioning any particular uh, country. You know, but it was also used by... So no, I, I think uh, uh, that's what I mean. If we need to rethink how... The, what, do want, what, what does the world want from the region, okay? Do they want to destroy the region, to divide it, to <laughs> help it? So I think these are big questions that we are not really clear about in the region because of the behavior of some international you know, countries in, in, in the conflict that we have. I think, I think this, is the, this is a historical times that we're going through. And even, to be honest with you, even, you know, scholars and thinkers are confused, you know, about what's going on and where we are going. So that it's, not, it's not an easy time for us in, 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 in the region. Um, I want to close with that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Well, I agree with you, but I think you're mainly pinpointing at junk or fast food, given that they're convenient and they're cheap. So these are also easily accessible and people tend to just grab and go on the go and eat them. But at the same time, I mean, if you look at it, fruits, vegetables and legumes, at least in the region where I come from, are definitely cheaper than animal-based 
foods. So if you convince people to eat these foods, then they would not be paying much and they would be healthy. On the other hand, uh, regarding uh, the, prom and here I come back to my point where I said that governments should push to promote and uh, have people have access to local and fresh food. They can do this by creating local circuits between production and consumption. And uh, finally, I just want to say that, of course, it's not easy to convince people to avoid meat. The problem is not to avoid meat, but to lower intake of meat. In the MENA region, all the populations tend to consume three to seven times more than the recommended amount. This is problematic. But if you consume in moderation, this is just fine. And in order to convince them, I think awareness and education is key in this. And uh, as I said, countries have a major role to play. They, should, they can try to have taxes, subsidy reforms for uh, healthy foods, you know, uh, having restrictions. And uh, enforcing easy to understand labels is very important also to educate the consumer with this regard. I stress on this because this is very important and critical. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. I hope I under, uh, how many years? I think if we really want to advance towards the SDGs and going with the trends and having a shift to proper sustainable diets, I think it should be done soon within the next 10 years or so. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks for the questions. Um, just a few points maybe I want to stress, um, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what's the place for regional cooperation uh, in all of this, or uh, the things that I was talking about. Do, are there prospects for any uh, sort of uh, uh, in, uh, more institutionalized uh, developments in, in, the mir uh, in the Middle East? But also, how does it all play in terms of conflict resolution or anti-terrorism in the broader sense? Now, uh, when I said that w one priority should be conflict resolution, should be, I mean, without uh, no progress on anti-terrorism in this region or, or other most affected regions, heavily affected regions, would be, uh, uh, could be achieved uh, without uh, progress, uh, uh, upgrading our capacity to manage conflicts of this type, where there is no functional state which could manage the conflict on its own. I mean, uh, you have Islamist uh, extremism, violent extremism in, in every second country in Asia, okay? <laughs> every second, this is a very standard thing for us in Asia. Can I say it's my Asian part, yeah? Uh, it's a standard thing. Every Muslim minority country has this problem. But the states are functional. China is a functional state. India is a functional state. It has multiple insurgents, multiple problems, yeah? but. Uh, not just Islamist, also a laboratory, you know, of all sorts of and types of terrorism, you know, in the top ten, it's in the top ten of most affected states. But, uh, but it can manage. Thailand is a functional state. Even the Philippines, you know, so the the problem is uh, is not with this type of conflict. The problem is with a very different type of conflict where you don't have a functional state. We have uh, sometimes even tools, a set of region, an arc of weak or failed states. So like at a certain point, we have uh, uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria uh, uh, really cross, cross uh, real, uh, real Al Jazeera, you know, the, the real uh, sort of violent between the two and, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, of course, all such conflicts, heavily transnationalized, intense civil wars, require you ultimately UN level solutions. UN level solutions. And it's a, a, a separate question whether you can have a UN level solution without also improving relations on the east-west <laughs> side these days. East, in the broad sense, New East, you know, it, it just goes beyond Europe. You know, it's, like, it's not just Russia, the West, the, the China, the US, it's really New East and New West. Yeah? But the problem, I, as I see it today, is that today you cannot have a UN-level solution. It just doesn't stand a chance. Uh, if if the, the basis for it is just the grand deal among the world's great powers. We are, we are past the age of grand, grand deals. Do not, do not expect a US-Russia deal on Syria. It's not going to... 
I mean, it's, it's just doesn't make sense unless, or I don't know, China, US, Russia deal on Afghanistan. These times are gone, you know, forever. None of this is gonna work unless it is based uh, upon and accompanied by some form of regional compact. It could be more formalized, it could be less formalized, it could be tacit, it could be, but unless, uh, well, first of all, neighbors, but also countries of the broader region, all regional stakeholders come to some form of agreement, even if it's circumstantial, even if it's just for this particular context, but uh, unless this happens, nothing's gonna happen today. So this is how regionalization and the rise of regions, regional powers manifest itself today. Yeah, so regional dimension is important. Uh, of course, I would, a uh, uh, second point I wanted to make. Yeah? The only re reason the world sort of came to the rescue in the case of Daesh, the only reason they cared, even so they couldn't assemble one coalition, even it had to be two, yeah? but the only reason they came to the rescue uh, and you've seen such an, uh, an, an abnormal level of mobilization of external, direct external engagement, is because the, the problem went beyond the region. It's because the uh, ISIS declared caliphate when global started to attract people from outside, started to inspire cells in your faraway nice peaceful countries, uh, and so on and so forth. Do not, so it was an exception. <laughs> it's not a rule. For, for all those groups, and these are the world's deadliest groups that stay at the regional level. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the world give, gives a damn, you know, but do not expect it's impossible to get similar level of mobilization of external engagement, which means the, the region will have to sort it out for itself at some point. Now, it types of regional cooperation, which was a very good uh, question, I think. What is, because one thing is what is desirable and another thing is what is feasible. <laughs> yeah? I would say at the present stage, of course, uh, um, uh, calling for kind of immediate, immediate major progress towards some collective, regional collective security, uh, all regional collective security organization, these are not just premature, they're a bit, uh, they are just unrealistic, you know? Yeah, but, uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, some of the uh, recent uh, regional initiatives, but the ones is, if they're explicitly sort of directed from the outside. Uh, I'll give an example of the Warsaw, Warsaw initiative, yeah? Uh, if they are co really confrontational, if their main rationale is like in this case, anti-Iranian, <laughs> That's the point of having this, this, uh, this, this kind of group of countries. Uh, they, they are counterproductive, they don't solve the problem. I mean, part of the, uh, one problem of the um, more, more um, sort of circumstantial, more, more practical uh, Russian uh, initiative with Astana on Syria was uh, from the beginning, well, it was not a major format, it was a ceasefire, it was not real peace talks. Nothing of the kind, it was like a ceasefire preliminary format. But one, uh, I mean, Arab states of the region had every right to say that, you know, okay, it involves regional countries, uh, Iran, Turkey, but uh, it, it does not involve any, any of the Arab countries. So uh, three non-Arab countries are trying to solve the, the fate of an, well, Arab, Arab countries, part of the Levant. Uh, now they're trying, they've been, uh, Jordan has been an observer since, uh, I think, early on because it's, it's, it's heavily affected, you know, the refugees and, and everything. Now also uh, Egypt, Lebanon, uh, others are sort of becoming. Uh, but again, uh, I think the solution at this moment, not maybe a solution, but a, a way to go, is to uh, look at more uh, context-specific, uh, focus, really problem focused, you know, uh, problem solving uh, in just multilateral way within the region, wherever it's possible, you know. Yes, it could be situational. Yes, it could be just temporary marriage of convenience, but we actually see it on Syria. We start seeing that on Syria, partly when even the, the you know, the Emirates, uh, the, uh, the others now, Bahrain and others are kind of uh, um, uh, they already reopened, you know, offices in, uh, in Damascus and so and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, or 
Another way is to look at it would be maybe, let's look at the Sahel, let's look at the Africa. Maybe at first, sub-regional, sub-regional formats uh, could be, especially if they are problem focused, could be more useful rather than this overarching schemes. You know, but still having in mind the need to establish broader regional, at least dialogue, you know, at least some structured dialogue on security matters. Uh, and again, maybe the starting point for that more structured dialogue will not be in the Mediterranean. My, my rough guess would be that it will be in the, middle, in the Gulf as a more structured con conflict. I mean, confrontation, region, uh, regional rivalry, major rivalry between blocks or whatever, uh, does not prevent structured dialogue. OECE was born in Europe at the time when Europe was really divided. <laughs> we had like uh, major, major dividing lines in Europe, uh, two blocks and so on and so forth. The more structured the context, the easier, maybe even, the easier to start at some point uh, a structured dialogue, which is why if you've noticed, I don't know if you follow this, but for instance, Russia has for, 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 for years played up with this collective security, regional framework, uh, partly to outweigh, counterweigh, you know, all the, the attempts to NATO, NATO, NATO for Mediterranean or something as usual, you know, it's, it's projecting our internal problems to problems with the, the, with the West on the Middle East. But more recently, if you've noticed, uh, practically uh, last month, yeah, uh, the, the, the way this concept now has been revised for us, now it's calling for a more collective security dialogue or mechanism in the Gulf. Let's start with, the, at least with the Gulf, you know, which is a, which is a, a revision, you know. Um, uh, so I don't know if it answers your question. In terms of clandestine, uh, clandestine actors, you know, uh, proxy wars, uh, I know my definition of terrorism does not even include actors which are not, which are basically on payroll of security services. Call it what they are, I don't know, covert operations, uh, whatever. For, 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 for me, terrorism is genuine uh, tactic available to non-state actors, asymmetrical tactic, a weapon of the week, when you cannot uh, uh, target effectively your opponent, uh, uh, you have a huge asymmetry in terms of power and status, you know, so. I have to I have to wrap up. Sorry, but uh, yes, it's a it's a widespread phenomenon in the in the Middle East and in other regions. But I, I don't see it as a root cause. It, it's more a manifestation of a problem than the, the root cause of uh, of uh, you know degree of uh, exposure of the region of the region to the. It's a, I, I, I'd say it's, it's a facilitating factor. Thank you, sure, uh, Katerina. We were almost finishing on time. <laughs> <laughs> but you're fully excused because you made very interesting points. But let's move to the concluding remarks session. So I would invite, uh, I don't know them by face, so please uh, come to the podium. Uh, we have uh, the representative from the uh, Young Blood Strategic Forum program, the director, please come to the podium. And, and also uh, the head of the National Assembly delegation to the OEC parliamentary Assembly, is he in the room? Just one word of um, introduction. The OEC is many things uh, at the same time. One important part is the uh, parliamentary uh, component. From what I know, uh, the parliamentary uh, the assembly of the OEC uh, will soon hold the meeting in Morocco, uh, which is a first, I think, for the organization. Uh, there is a dialogue between the assembly and the Mediterranean partners, but I think this is the first time that one of the regular meetings is taking place in uh, Morocco. And as Secretariat, we are very uh, glad that the Parliamentary Assembly is doing so much in terms of Mediterranean engagement because it nicely complements what we do. We deal more with governments, meaning the executives, but you deal with uh, the legislators who are equally, if not more important, because they represent or should represent the people. So uh, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. I think you can uh, also speak from the microphone over there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, uh, vorrei anche nuovamente ringraziare l'ambasciatore Trichilo per uh, l'invito. I would like to uh, thank very much uh, dear Ambassador Trichilo for the invitation. I'm particularly happy to be here today and also very pleased to have uh, the opportunity to say a few words at the end of this uh, gathering. Uh, I certainly cannot compete with the eminent speakers that preceded me uh, and I don't have the pretension to say something that you haven't heard yet. So I will confine myself to extrapolate some of the ideas we dealt uh, about uh, in these few hours. Um, as we heard, the Euro-Mediterranean region is heterogeneous and in uh, many aspects. If on one hand uh, we see increasing cultural and human uh, bonds between our societies, we experience renewed tensions and are heavily divided by old and new rifts on the other. Uh, despite different geopolitical perceptions, the engagement among Mediterranean countries presents the opportunity for greater regional cooperation on a range of issues, including policy, security, security and economic growth. In such regard, the young population, the largest and fastest expanding demographic group in the region, must be the driver of progressive ideas and collaboration. Increased co cooperation has the potential to lead to shared regional norms and institutions that promote regional stability and support in conflict resolutions. Yet the potential for regional cohesion is limited, both because of the differences in national priorities and the recent and long-standing conflicts that are also led to the phenomenon of migrations. Uh, it seems that the Mediterranean region is perceived mainly as a source of instability rather than a region with uh, great potential. I am thus uh, particularly happy to, uh, that today's debate also focused on other issues of uh, this uh, important uh, region. Uh, global interdependence has not yet reached all Mediterranean states, and we highlighted this uh, today many times. While the northern ones on the so-called European shore enjoy strengthened political and economic integration, profound divisions characterize the relations among southern ones. Democratic and rich, the north contrasts with the shortages and political turmoil of the south. The southern region is also plagued by a series of other issues, such as the lack of infrastructure, a less educated workforce, and a high unemployment, international and internal migration, environmental degradation, and human trafficking, to mention just a few. These impediments to the region's security and economic growth can neither be confronted independently nor be viewed in isolation from one another. Regional political cooperation failures have been attributed to non-convergent national interests. Conflicts to the, in the Middle East and various geopolitical factors. The countries that of the South, and South Mediterranean often cope with divisions, which are sometimes the result of direct conflicts. Other times they're caused by differing priorities, extra-regional alliances, and ties to different international organizations. A Eurocentric approach based on a narrow geopolitical conception of the Mediterranean 
that neglects the perspectives and the demands of the states and <coughs> local populations has distinguished the Euro-Mediterranean policies in this field. Sector-based cooperation and integration, however, provides an opportunity to strengthen the economic governance of the entire region. Second major fact emerging from the debate that is the challenges affecting the Mediterranean region are inextricably linked to the security of the area and call for cooperative solutions as they cannot be effectively ta tackled by any single country or organization alone. Therefore, we need to step up our engagement in the context of the existing multilateral mechanisms. It is also essential to discuss how to make better use of them. Worth mentioning, for example, is the OSCE Mediterranean Partnership as a forum for dialogue, de decreasing tensions, and promoting cooperation throughout the Euro Mediterranean region. Given the considerable number of players involved in the tackling of the issues at international, reg regional, and uh, local levels, it is crucial to improve cooperation and coordination among the institutions as well as within our own organizations. Perhaps some recommendations may be relevant to establish regular sub-regional mechanisms for cooperation to set up institutions and organize regular regional conferences to intensify dialogue on common challenges, such as refugee crisis, to identify and propose incentives for conflict uh, resolution efforts when possible, and to facilitate civil society cooperation. However, the weaker the state, the more conflicts are protect, protracted. Even if at uh, the beginning of my interve intervention, uh, I pointed out that the Mediterranean question should not be reduced merely to migration, I would like to spend two sentences on that. Uh, it is essential to uh, address the root causes of migration and refugee flows, such as uh, conflicts, climate change, and poverty, by developing long-term policies, in particular by providing development assistance and humanitar humanitarian aid, taking to into account gender specificities. And it is also evident that there is a need to reform the common European asylum system. Multilateral and bilateral cooperation between countries of departures and the countries of destination offers us a chance to improve the regulation of general migration issues. Aiming, at, aiming to strengthen legal, legal migration and fight against trafficking in human beings. It is also up to us to assess whether encouraging migration to fill job, job vacancies in the host countries is not detrimental to the countries of departure, which sometimes lose their best, especially young people, though legal migration channel, through, sorry, through legal migration channels. The problems that we share generate new interdependencies between Europe and its Mediterranean partners, forcing both to think about how to join efforts to achieve common security and bridge the development gap that still divides Europe from our southern neighbors. Dear participants, a positive agenda for the Mediterranean cooperation should not exclude the young generation. To overcome the existing challenges, we must listen to the experiences and perspectives of young representatives and leaders who are only yet entering the stage, but who will also shape the, the future of 
our societies over the coming decades. Today's initiative was intended as an important step in that direction. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody from my side as well. My name is Melicha. I'm Young BSF Program Director for the New Faces here. In the last three days, Young BSF orchestrated over 20 panels, workshops, fireside chats with over 40 speakers. So you can see that I've designed a program that that's why half of the young people here look half dead. They didn't get any sleep in the last days. Um, I'm not gonna even pretend I'm an expert on this topic, so I will just uh, shortly conclude this session. I'm really glad for all the cooperation that we have done so far with the embassy and with the Instituto Affari Internazionali. I'm hoping it's gonna become a tradition in following editions of Young BSF as well. It started as a idea, let's do something, by Ambassador Tricula. I've, experienced, I've uh, experimented a bit with the format last year and this year we've taken it even further and I think it's become a really interesting session. It's a super important topic to discuss and I'm really glad it's the concluding one of the Young BSF program. I'm the one standing in between you and the small reception that we have outside, but I would just like to give you a couple of notes from the organizers. The uh, gathering at the festival hall starts at 1 p.m. I would kindly suggest you to be there as early as possible to make sure that you have a seat in the festival hall. I would also suggest you to download the BSF app that we have so, can you, so you can effectively follow all the panels and sessions that are happening. Um, that would be it from my side. I would kindly invite you outside for this small reception where we can also informally discuss a bit further and maybe gather ideas for the next year's Young VSF. Thank you so much. Thank you again. So see you at the buffet lunch generously offered by the Italian Embassy here in Slovenia. <laughs>